I'd like to call to order the West Covina Planning Commission uh, for Tuesday, August 27th at 7 p.m. And I would like to ask all of you to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance given to us by Councilman Castellanos. And I would ask that you remain standing for a few minutes in remembrance of two great people that served this city. One is Nancy Manners, who was a councilwoman and a mayor, and the other is Officer uh, Reedy, who gave his life up. It'll be 30 years this Saturday. So please remain standing for a few moments after the pledge. Thank you. Ready? Thank you. Can we have roll call, please? Commissioner Valles? Present. Commissioner Menifee? Present. Mr. Commissioner Castellanos? Present. Commissioner Blackburn? Present. Chairman Holtz? Present. Uh, any additions or changes to the approval of the minutes of July 23rd? No. None. We have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Oh. All in favor? Aye. Okay, this brings us to oral communication. This is a time when any member of the public may speak to the commission on any matter within the scope of duties assigned to the commission relating to non-agenda-sized or consent calendar items. Other matters included on this agenda may be addressed when that item is under consideration. For all oral communication, the chairperson may impose reasonable limitations on public comments to assure an orderly and timely meeting. The Ralph M. Brown Act limits the Planning Commission and staff's ability to respond to public comments at this meeting. Thus, your comments may be agenicized for a future meeting or referred to staff. The Commission may ask questions for clarification if desired at this time. By policy of the Commission, oral communications at this time on the agenda is limited to a total of 15 minutes. Persons who are not afforded the opportunity to speak at this time may do so under item E later on the agenda. Do we have anybody who wishes to speak on any item? Do you want to speak on the Yahuka? That Do you want to speak on that later when it comes up? Okay. Is there anybody else who wants to speak on oral communications? Okay. I'll close oral communications at this time. <clears throat> Brings us to the consent calendar. Does anybody want, on the council wish to pull anything off for discussion at this time? No. None? Okay. And it stands and receive and file. Uh, can we have a motion and second to approve the items listed on the consent calendar as presented? So okay. Uh, second? Okay. Uh, first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five oh. Thank you. Brings us to public hearing continued from July twenty third, twenty thirteen, variance number thirteen dash oh three, categorical exemption. Applicant is Stephen Liu for Westfield. 112 Plaza Drive, Westfield, Covina Mall. May we hear the staff report, please? Yes, Senior Planner Fabiola Wong will be presenting that report. Good evening, Chairman and members of the Planning Commission. Um, let me get my...
Okay, sorry about that. Westfield applicant is requesting a sign approval to accommodate um, their new tenant, Amapola Market. The new 27,243 square foot tenant space is located on the southwestern portion of the mall on the first floor uh, across from Sears. The applicant is proposing three signs. Um, an 85 square foot sign uh, will be installed on the south elevation. A 23 square foot wall sign on the parking structure facing uh, West Covina Parkway. Um, the West Covina Municipal Code allows signage uh, only on frontages that face a street or public parking area with an entrance exclusive to the tenant space. In this case, the Amapola Market will provide access from the inside of the mall only. Therefore, the applicant is requesting a variance to install the three signs. The mall sign criteria identify tenant spaces with more than 15,000 square feet, but less than 99,999 square feet um, of floor area as mini anchors. The Planning Commission approved signage for a similar mini anchor uh, of Broadway shoes. The granting of this variant uh, will allow Amapola Market to have a similar signage opportunities as other mini anchor tenants within the mall. It will also allow visibility from the parking lot and the freeway. The south elevation of the mall does not provide um, the same unobstructed visibility as the north elevation. The south elevation visibility is partially obstructed by buildings located um, located along West Covina Parkway and the parking structure, as you can see on the slide. It is the city's goal to ensure that all businesses um, and the all businesses succeed and thrive within the city and the community, as well as uh, providing a wide range of shopping opportunities for its residents and surrounding communities. The applicant is requesting a variance from the sign standards allowing exterior wall signs uh, for a tenant with an interior entrance only. Staff has analyzed the proposal and concludes that it merits um, approval subject to the conditions of approval. Um, the applicant is also here if you have any questions of the applicant, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have of staff. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Not at this time? Okay. Okay, Commissioner. This is in regards to the uh, signs. Uh, since it's in the mall, uh, that's for Jeff. I'm sorry, I wanted to ask Jeff. Um, what is the uh, privileges that we as commissioners have since the, the parking lot, doesn't the parking lot belong to the Westfield Shopping Center? Where they want to put the sign, do we have a right to suggest where signs should be going on in the mall? Well, yes, a, a, under the zoning code, no matter who owns the property, uh, private property is under zoning, uh, zoning code requirements. So the zoning code says um, that there are certain places that signs can be placed and other places that they can't be. And so that's, and size is another issue. So that's the issue here. They're asking for signage to be placed on structures that are not part of their tenant space. So how does the uh, Westfield um owners feel about the signs going up well westfield is here to they, they can they'll speak under the public hearing and probably okay. you can ask them th that right. question thank they're you. in support of, of the application okay thank you anyone else no uh, we have somebody here that'd like to speak on behalf of the in favor of the project My name is Mark Ingram, um, representing Westfield in, uh, in place of Steve Blue. Um, Westfield is in favor and supports the signage to be added uh, to the building for the exterior signage. Uh, for the building, which is part of the Westfield building, as well as the parking structure, we feel that it is, has a, uh, a strong uh, identification for the tenant. It's a considered a mini anchor for us at 27,000 square feet, uh, and we're in full support of it. 
How much foot traffic do you expect once it's open to generate monthly? Uh, that's a bit out of my league. Uh, I deal with the tenants on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I can, I'm happy to find that information and, and bring it back to you, uh, but I don't have an actual count on what that would be. It's fairly significant, uh, otherwise we wouldn't have done the deal. Okay, good, thank you. I was just curious. It, I think it looks like a, well, it's a large space and I'm excited to have that filled. It is large and it has uh, just the demographic studies show that it's going to have a significant impact uh, with foot traffic. Good, thank you. Okay. Just out of curiosity, have you turned down anybody that has asked for a sign to be put up on the outside of the building? <laughs> Not to my knowledge. I just recently took over this property. Um, but I'm not aware of any previous uh, tenants that have been turned down okay. on that. Just out of curious. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak in favor of the project? Anybody want to speak in opposition to the project? If not, close it to public testimony and open up the commission discussion. Who would like to start? Uh, as far as uh, the projections look on the screen, I think uh, they're good locations. They, there are plenty of other signs, and if we could get that uh, tw those 27,000 square feet filled and and people in the mall, I think it'd be good for for everybody in the mall and the community. So I like it. Commissioner Blackburn, is this a specialty market? When it's a market, uh, I'm sorry, I should have asked you when you were. Commissioners, uh, the public hearing is currently closed, but we can open it back up and have the applicant come back up. Go ahead and reopen the public hearing, uh, Chairman. So we reopen the public hearing? I apologize. <laughs> uh, I have never heard of the, the market. Is it something that is, uh, is there a chain? Is it a specialty? It, it is a bit of a specialty market uh, from the standpoint that it's, it's unique. Uh, it is considered a deli and cafe and fresh food. Uh, they have produce. Uh, they will have a, uh, a sandwich serving areas. They'll have different um, uh, food products that will cater uh, across the board, uh, more or less. Uh, they do have another facility. I'm not familiar with it. This is the first time I've actually worked with this tenant. Mm -hmm. uh, but from, um, from everything that I've read in the meetings with them, uh, it's, it's a, a concept that is a full-service food market as well as diner. Uh, so you have uh, food service for a meal to take away, as well as a meal that you can sit down and eat at a counter, uh, as well as buying groceries. So it's a, it's a full service market to the community for uh, all your food, food product necessities. Anticipating uh, opening approximately when? Um, opening, uh, I'm believing that it was November, end of no, November 29th, I think is what the date is. And uh, so it's, it's, um, it is under construction with all permits uh, and doing very well. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's, it's a unique concept to the Westfield market, which we want to look at other areas. To be able to uh, to locate this tenant as well, I was by three or four days ago, and uh, they are working. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. They're they're making great headways. Thank you. They're looking very good. One Thanks. of the questions, as long as you have a record, how many other markets like this are in the area? Uh, I'm not familiar with the area. Um, someone else might have a better that's familiar. I, I actually live in Palm Springs and have been in San Diego for the last couple of years. But uh, in this area, um, for a full service market like that, I don't know if you have any fresh and easy close. 
that would probably be the closest, whereas Fresh and Easy doesn't necessarily have, they have meals that take away, but they're not actually preparing the meal there on site for service. Are there any other Amapola markets around at all? Uh, there is, uh, it's, uh, I believe it's down in Orange County, but I'm not 100% certain of the location. Okay. So they're not nationwide or? No, uh, no. Okay. No, it, it's a family-run business. Okay, thank yeah. you. Anybody else? Betty? Sorry. I have, in regards to, because of the name, Amapola, what type of food are they catering to? Is it, is it Mexican food or? Uh, prim, pr uh, predominantly, it, uh, I understand it to be uh, catering to the Hispanic market with uh, Mexican food specialties. But, you know, that doesn't necessarily limit uh, their, their produce, but that is the primary focus. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, we'll close public testimony again and open it to commission discussion. I can, I can, I, uh, if I, I just take one second, I can shed a little light. The Amapola family, I did meet the, the founders. Not the founder, the, the family who runs it. The, their founder, I think, was the grandfather who did immigrate from Mexico. So it, they started out as a Mexican market. I think they're in, there's one in Paramount, I think, and one in maybe Pico Rivera or something like that. So there's only a couple, and they're mostly in that, that, that vicinity. And basically the same operation? Uh, basically the same type of operation, yes. Are they in a, a, a mall like they're going in here? I don't believe so. I think this is a new, uh, new experience for them and for Westfield in this location. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll open up to commission discussion. Anything else, Commissioner Blackburn? Uh, as I say, I was by there. It uh, looked like it's a, a good fit for Westfield. It looks like it would be a good fit for the community. Uh, when I was by, they were definitely busy working. Uh, I would certainly be in favor of uh, the market coming in. It looked like it. Uh, I'm anxious to go eat. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Are you doing, Mr. Castellano? Uh, no, I didn't okay. say anything else. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think it's interesting uh, going in. I know I, when Walmart went in over at Eastland, I had uh, some reservations, but they're doing a landslide business over there in a, in a you know, in a mall operation. So, be interesting to see how it, it moves forward. Okay, uh, staff. We have uh, resolution numbers, please. Yes, there's one resolution number, which will be 13 5531. 5531. Okay. Uh, can I have a motion and a second? I'd like to move to rec um, recommend adoption of the resolution approving variance number 13 03. Second. Uh, 13 5531. Right? Yeah, he was, I think, um, Commissioner Castellanos was referring to the <coughs> application number, which is variance is 1303. Okay. But you're correct. The resolution number is 13-5531. 5531. Okay. We've got a first. We have a second. Second with Commissioner Valley. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Good luck. Okay. Brings us to uh, general plan amendment number 1303. 1303, uh, code amendment number 1306, declaration of environmental impact, applicant city of West Covina, the request proposed general amendment, plan amendment would update the housing element to establish city of West Covina goals, policies, and implementation measures for addressing housing needs within the city in order to implement the proposed goals and policies of the draft 2014 to 2021 housing element. A code amendment is proposed to modify the density bonus standards of the low to middle income and senior citizen housing in compliance with state law. May we have a staff report, please? Yes, uh, just a little bit of background here. We have been working on this uh, general plan amendment to update the housing element for the last several months. As some of you may recall, we did uh, adopt an updated housing element late last year for the previous cycle. Um, this cycle is 2014 through 2021. We did contract with a firm called ESA, Environmental Science Associates, and we do have representatives from that company tonight. We'll have Sarah Walker, who will be presenting um, the bulk of the information on that, the, the housing element update itself. 
And then after she has completed that, uh, Fabiola Wong will be presenting the information on the code amendment. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Sarah. Good evening, commissioners. Um, once again, I'm Sarah Walker. Um, I'm a senior associate at Environmental Science Associates. And my colleague, um, Arlene Granadosen, is also here. She's also with Environmental Science Associates. Um, and I'm here tonight. I was fortunate enough to get to work with the city um, while at my previous firm on the 2008 housing element update and then um, continued uh, at my new firm to work on the 2014 housing element update. So this has been kind of an ongoing process. I've been working with staff for the last five years to make sure that the city has a certified document um, as part of their general plan. So I'm here tonight to begin the adoption process for the 2014 housing element. So, uh oh, the text is not there. <laughs> Sorry, just a moment. It's very odd. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> Hit it again. Oh, okay. I didn't set it to that. Okay. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so just starting broadly, a general plan, um, every jurisdiction in California is required to have a general plan which serves as their blueprint for guiding physical development and setting city policy. And the housing element is one of seven state mandated um, elements of the general plan and it is the only element of the general plan that is required to be reviewed and certified by a state agency, which is the California Department of Housing and Community Development. And you you'll, might hear me refer to that as HCD moving forward. Um, so with the passage of SB 375, housing elements are now updated every eight years. Um, consistent with the Regional Transportation Plan and, commu and Sustainable Community Strategy, which has been completed for the region by the Southern California Association of Governments, or SCAG. So this will be the fifth housing element planning cycle, and it covers the years 2014 to 2021. So a housing element, importantly, it sets policies and goals related to housing, and the state recognizes that the role of the city is not to physically build housing, but to create opportunities in their land use plan and to develop or to facilitate development through their policies, such as the zoning code and general plan. So a housing element um, is divided into essentially seven sections. Um, the introduction provides a document overview. The housing plan provides specific goals, policies, and programs to facilitate housing opportunities. The quantitative objective section um, is an estimate of how many units might realistically be constructed as well as units that may be assisted um, during the planning period by the city. Um, the technical background report includes three subsections. Um, the housing profile, which includes population, employment, and housing um, demographic information. The housing constraints analysis, which addresses governmental as well as non-governmental constraints, which ranges from um, fees that are charged to development standards, also construction cost, and how these all affect the ability of developers to construct housing. And also the housing resources section, which includes financial and land resources, um, including a detailed sites inventory. And finally, there's the progress report, which evaluates the city's progress towards the implementation of the 2008 housing element. So given that the 2008 housing element was recently adopted and certified in 2012, um, little has changed in this 2014 housing element update. So the update for this planning period was um, streamlined and it was quickly pre-certified by the State Department of Housing and Community Development. So to complete the update, what we've changed and updated is um, we've prepared a progress report on the city's accomplishments during the 2008 to 2014 planning period. Um, we updated the community profile and needs assessment using 2010 census data. Um, we reviewed constraints and reported any changes since the previous planning period. And we've also reviewed the site's inventory to make sure that if any sites have been developed that were identified, we've removed them and replaced them, which because it was so recently certified, we did not have to do, but I'll discuss that a little later. And we also prepared a new housing plan based on the information reported in these um, other sections. So as the housing plan is intended to guide housing development and assistance for the next eight years, I wanted to quickly go over the five goals that have been established. 
Um, the first goal is to maintain and enhance the quality of existing housing and residential neighborhoods in West Covina. And this goal includes programs focused on code enforcement, assistance programs for residents to improve their properties, um, and also the implementation of energy efficient design into residential projects. Um, for example, the city has the home preservation program and the home improvement loan program, which have been very successful at assisting um, residents to um, update their and uh, rehabilitate their units. Um, the second goal is to provide a variety of housing types to accommodate all economic segments of the city. And this goal includes programs that are focused on acquiring and rehabilitating existing developments to potentially provide affordable units. Um, also encouraging the development of units to meet the needs of special needs groups such as the elderly and large families. And also partnering with Los Angeles County to provide access to their programs such as Section 8 housing vouchers. So the city's third goal is to ensure that all types of housing can be built and that the city does not have policies or ordinances in place that hinder residential development in an unreasonable way. And this, the programs under this goal range from providing density bonuses to streamlining the time spent in the development process. The fourth goal in the housing plan is to promote equal housing opportunities. This goal is achieved through programs that provide reasonable accommodation for residents with disabilities that may be requesting a modification to their home to accommodate their disability. Um, also by partnering with the Fair Housing Foundation to provide information and services to specific resident groups. And the city also offers programs to help find housing solutions for seniors and also provides community development block grant funding for homeless assistance programs. So the final, the fifth and final goal in the housing plan is to identify adequate sites to achieve housing variety. And this goal is intended to ensure that the city has identified an inventory of sites to accommodate their fair share regional housing need, which I'm going to discuss in just a moment. Um, it's also accomplished by encouraging redevelopment of small sites into larger cohesive projects um, through lot consolidation. So together, these five goals are intended to preserve the existing housing, to encourage growth into the right areas of the city, and to provide residents with the housing-related services that they need. So linked to the, commu the Sustainable Community Strategy and the Regional Transportation Plan, which are prepared by the Southern California Association of Governments, is the RENA, the Regional Housing Needs Allocation. So the Regional Housing Needs Allocation starts up with the state. Um, HCD allocates units to the regional government, which in this instance for West Covina, they are part of this, the SCAG region. Um, SCAG then res is responsible for allocating units to their members' jurisdictions, and every jurisdiction is allocated their fair share of units. Um, and is responsible to plan for those units um, through the housing element. And once again, it's not a matter of building the units, but rather um, providing opportunities through land use, the general plan and zoning code to facilitate development. So as you can see, um, West Covina's um, RENA allocation for 2014 is 831 units. Um, this is actually a large decrease from the previous planning period when the RENA was 2,642 units. And you can see that the arena has been distributed amongst four, incomes, four income groups. Um, 217 units were allocated for very low, 129 units for low income, and 138 for moderate, and the remaining 347 for above moderate. And this is just a goal what the, the city is, through their land use policies, attempting to accommodate as these income groups, this number of units for these income groups. So as part of the housing element, a detailed site inventory was prepared to show what land resources are available to accommodate the city's RENA allocation. And as I mentioned previously, because the 2008 um, housing element was so recently adopted, the sites that were identified in that element were not redeveloped during the time since last year. So they are included and have not changed um, in this current update. Um, so the site's inventory looked primarily at underutilized sites, about approximately 70 acres within the central business district that were rezoned to the mixed-use overlay. And the overlay allows for development at densities between 30 to 75 units. And we assumed an average density of 45 units to do our calculations. 
and this area is able to accommodate a total of 1,564 units if it were developed at this average density, assuming mixed-use project 50% residential development. So you can see here, um, the top line shows the mixed-use overlay area. Um, what I've done is evenly distributed the number of units that can be accommodated on that 70 acres amongst the four income groups and compared it to the 2014 RENA. And you can see that the city's actually identified a surplus of opportunity as compared. So there are a larger number of units that have been identified than what the city um, needed for this planning period. So tonight is the first step in the approval process to finalize the housing element document. Assuming that tonight it's recommended for consideration to city council, the council will then review and hopefully adopt the element. And following adoption, it will be sent back up to the State Department for a final review and final certification. And one change for this housing element um, period is that they now have a strict due date of when housing elements are due. Last time the city was unable to complete that until 2012. This time they're very firmly putting in place a due date so that it, you can no longer push that deadline out. So the deadline for this year is October 15, 2014. I think the city is on a good track to, to meet that deadline. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Fabiola for the zoning code. Actually, before I um, cover the code amendment, do you have any questions for Sarah? Yeah, I have one. I, I know right now because of budget restraints, we have one heck of a time enforcing uh, the code and many of the buildings that are going in. And I noticed that's goal number one was, you know, code enforcement and staying on top of it. You know, our, I don't see our budget getting any better that we're going to add any more code enforcement people. So how do we control that? And are there any penalties if we don't? You know, I mean... Well, I, we have a goal, and, and that, that is the goal. Um, you know, sometimes you fall short of goals, and sometimes you, so, and this is a goal for an eight-year period. So uh, I don't know that any of us have a crystal ball and know what it's going to be like in 2018, but that, so it's, it's a long-term goal um, and something that we're setting a, sort of a threshold or a bar to try to achieve. I think that's the way to, to look at that. I mean, you, you set goals that you, you don't have right now. Right, mm -hmm. so it's sort of reaching out that that's the goal that we want to attain. Um, also, so I mean, in the progress report, during the previous planning period, the city used actually community development block grants to help fund the code enforcement program and addressed over 3,000 um, violations or calls related to code enforcement, which is pretty impressive. Um, and right, like Jeff said, this is a goal for the eight year planning period. Um, there is no um, repercussions if you don't meet your goal. The goal is just to maintain housing within the city using existing programs that are yeah, in place. So it's really something we would like to see happen, but if it doesn't happen, there's no penalties, there's no delay of improvements or anything uh, uh, because we can't get out there to, to approve these different codes and all that? Right. So right now, the housing element commits the city to having the code enforcement, continuing to do code enforcement and continuing to address complaints as, you know, as best as possible with the resources that you have available. And that's what, there's no hard number set in the housing element that you must address, say, 10,000 violations. You just have to continue the program, which seems like it probably will continue. But you're correct. There are no penalties if you don't. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Sarah before we move on to the code amendment? Okay. okay that brings us to the code amendment. Um, the city adopted adopted its low, moderate income and senior citizen housing in 1996, which is basically the density bonus ordinance. Uh, since that time, the state law governing state density bonus law has been modified to encourage developers to build affordable housing by requiring local jurisdictions to offer meaningful incentives. 
Therefore, all jurisdictions must update their respective zoning ordinances in compliance with the most recent state law provisions. The draft ordinance proposes to amend the current residential bonus regulations as required by state law. So what is a density bonus? Local governments allow a developer to build at a higher density than the zoning permit in exchange for the developer to include some affordable residences. For over 25 years, California State has required local governments to give developers or builders who include affordable residences in their new developments um, a 25% density bonus. The previous law required local governments to grant a flat density bonus of 25% for developments with 20% lower income units, 10% very low, or 50 for seniors, and a flat 10% density bonus for condominiums with 20% moderate income units. The law was changed to create a range of density bonuses. And this is gonna get a little confusing um, in a minute, but just bear with me. <laughs> Under the new law, instead of 20% low income unit, 20% very low, or 20% moderate, an applicant can obtain a density bonus by providing 10% low, 5% very low, or 10% moderate. The applicant receives a reduced density bonus for this reduced level of targeting, a 20% density bonus for the reduced level of low and very low income units, and a 5% density bonus for the moderate income units. This allows an applicant to obtain a lower income density bonus of 20 to 35%, a very low income density bonus of 20 to 35%, um, either in a condominium or planned unit development, PUDs, a moderate income density bonus of 5 to 35%. Within the ranges, the density bonus increases as the percentage of affordable units increases. For the, low income, um, for the low income density bonus, the law, law allows a 20% bonus for developments with 10% low income units and increases by 1.5% for every percentage of low income above 10%, up to a cap of 35%. So in the slide, you can see um, how the density bonus will be applied and how that 1.5% increases as the unit. Um, do increase. So it goes all the way up to 35%. I, I couldn't fit all the numbers, so you could get the idea on the scale. On the scale. For very low income um, density bonus, the law allows a 20% bonus for development with 5% very low income units and increases that 2.5% for every percentage of very low income units above 5%, again up to 35%. For the senior housing density bonus, the law allows a 20% bonus for any senior development rather than a 25% density bonus for housing with at least 50% seniors. For the moderate income condominium plan unit development density bonus, the law allows 5% for condos and PUDs development with 10% moderate income unit and increases that by 1% for every percentage of moderate income units above 10%, up to 35%. Previously, this density bonus was only applicable to condominium projects. The law requires um, jurisdictions to offer one to three incentives, such as reductions in parking, setbacks, open space, etc., uh, rather than one based on the percentage of targeted units and requires any incentive to, to result in identifiable, financially sufficient and actual cost reduction. So the developer is responsible for showing how that is going, that, that is significant. The law um, created the moderate income density bonus to PUDs, plan unit development, um, and it also requires the first occupant to be moderate income rather than requiring a 10-year term of affordability and also requires equity sharing on resale. Allows a flat 20% density for all senior housing rather than a 25% bonus for housing with 50% seniors as previously allowed. And it also 
I think I got out of sync here. He also uh, created the land donation density bonus um, for applicants who donate land for very low income housing to a local government or, de or developer approved by the jurisdiction if the land meets requirements related to um, by right zoning, location, sites, size, etc. Limits parking standards that jurisdiction can impose on density bonus development. The housing element update is considered um, a general plan amendment uh, and also uh, the code amendment uh, is subject to CEQA. Uh, in November 2012, as Sarah discussed, the city certified the initial study uh, mitigative neg negative declaration for the 2008-2014 housing element and mixed use overlay zone, which evaluated the impacts of uh, of, of the zoning as well as the housing element update. Since the housing element update includes minor changes to the previous update, an addendum to the mitigative negative declaration has been prepared and included in your packet for your review. This addendum demonstrates that the environmental analysis impacts and mitigation requirements identified in the mitigative negative declaration uh, for the 2008-2014 housing element update remain substantively in support um, the finding that the proposed project does not raise any new issues and does not exceed the level of impacts identified in the previous MND. In conclusion, as the letter dated, on June, dated June 28, 2013 from the Department of Housing and Community Development, which is also included in your packet, indicated um, that the draft housing element meets all the statutory requirements and that the element could be certified um, as long as the city amended the this, this, um, density bonus ordinance. As discussed in the staff report, there are benefits in having a certified housing element, such as allowing the city to guide where the growth will occur with, a develop, with the city being able to ap um, apply for house, housing grants and eliminating the ability of developers and housing advocates to file lawsuits against the city for not being in compliance. Also, the proposed code amendment meets the requirements of a state law, which will assist in the implementation of goal three within the draft housing element, which is the program um, 3.2, that demonstrate that, that is the density bonus ordinance um, that will encourage for construction of affordable unit. Staff recommended that the Planning Commission adopt resolution recommending the City Council approval of, approval of the General Plan Number 1303 related to the Housing Element Update, as well as Code Amendment uh, Number 13-06. And that concludes my presentation, and I'll be more than happy ha more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, on page eight, uh, you go to page eight of 13-06. It's just criteria, affordable requirements. Um, are you looking at the ordinance itself? I'm sorry. Or are you looking at the staff report? I'm looking at the staff report. Okay. General plan amendment. There's a, there's a graph. Yeah. And it talks about criteria, affordable requirement, density bonus. Um, yeah, there's a table included there. Um, basically, there are three up to three incentives that are allowed. And so based on what you are providing, uh, you, if you provide one incentive, you can get a 5% okay. increase. Okay, well, my question is, if you look at the criteria, it says very low income. It says at least 5% of the total units uh, are restricted to very low income. And you go to low income, it says at least 10% of the total units in a housing zone are restricted to moderate income and then moderate income 10% to moderate, is that a typo in low income? It is, yeah, I apologize for that. Okay. It's supposed to be low income. Okay, and uh, do you have the figures? What consists of low income, very low income, and moderate income? Uh, yes, if you look in the Exhibit A on the draft ordinance, it has definitions of what that means and uh, the area. Exhibit A in the big? Uh, let me um, find it for you. Exhibit A, nine thousand pages. Exhibit A is, is most of the middle part of the document. It's right after the staff report, 
There's a resolution for the um, general plan amendment, and then there's the housing element itself as Exhibit A. So it, it is the good part of it. In here? Sarah Wolf. All right. Yeah, it is. Okay, is there a page number? Just give us a second. Okay. Sorry, just going back to the, one of the slides, it has next to the income groups, very low, is referring to people that earn between, or households that have an income between zero to 50% of the area median income, which I believe for Los Angeles is around $65,000 a so, year. So, so it 50, depends on the area? It depends, in? it's usually done by the county. So, um, so it would be for all of Los Angeles County would be considered the area median income. So, page 57 of the, um, that document okay. in the bottom corner will say 2014-2021 housing element. Okay, I see it. So it's it's based on the income of the of the people that live there. In other words, if there's two people that live there, it's more than one. Okay, and that's the graph that does that. Okay. Just just so I basically understand, if somebody builds a housing development, are you saying that, that at least five percent of the total units in that housing development have to be for very low income people? It's not, we don't, the city doesn't require affordable units to be built when a private developer proposes uh, a project. But if the developer is proposing to do affordable units, those, that's already guidelines depending on what incentives or concessions the developer is asking of the city, then that's how those affordable units will be constructed and depending on what um, concessions the developer is asking is how you determine how many units the percentage they're going to get. So if, he's, so if he's asking for certain concessions, then he has to meet this guideline? Correct. Is that what you're saying? Yes. If he doesn't ask for any concessions, then he doesn't have to provide a percentage of low income or anything else. He can just do whatever. That is correct. The city doesn't have an inclusion, inclusionary housing ordinance. Okay. Everybody understand that? Yes. I have a question. I have a question. Uh, I think I've grossly misunderstood something. We talked about the central business district, which I think generally is between the freeway and West Covina Parkway and Glendora, kind of in that area. Don't I understand that the bonuses uh, will allow us to meet the requirements just by applying them to that area or no? No, by, by doing um, the mixed use overlay zone, which was applied to the central business district, allowed the city to provide the zoning to meet the, their fair share of housing that were, it could be constructed. But it has yeah. nothing to do with the density bonus. Um, the density bonus can apply in other properties within the city that is oh. outside that overlay, mixed use overlay zone. If I can add to that, Chair. Um, Basically, to add to, to what Ms. Wong indicated is that the current overlay zone allows for a certain level of density, okay, that, and that was zone, rezoned in order for us to comply with our housing requirements under the housing element. This density bonus, however, is pretty much a second layer on top of that, meaning that if a developer comes in and wants to build over that permitted threshold, they could use, utilize the density bonus to build those additional units on top of what's already allowed. Um, based on the number of affordable units um, and, and depending on how many concessions they want. And that would apply throughout the city. Anywhere in the city. Correct. But uh, again, just to, to reiterate, um, it doesn't require developers to build these types of units. Um, it's only if they want to um, utilize the bonuses that state law and 
the municipal code would allow. And if they want concessions. Correct. And it, maybe if I just provide some practical information, you know, we've had a couple of housing projects before us over the last couple of years, including one at the Old Wick site and one on San Bernardino Road. Those didn't have com any component of affordability or senior housing, so they, they went by the zoning. Um, however, if you remember, and you've probably been, some, most of you have probably been by the, the senior housing projects on Workman. There's two of them. They were built at two different times. Those did. They had a density bonus. They were 100% uh, affordable and 100% senior. So they were granted a density bonus under our, our current code and would be allowed to be granted the same type of bonus under this proposed code. What about the new project that was just approved on San Bernardino Road? There's no affordable context or senior context to that. It was just approved under a, a straight zoning. Even though they asked for concessions? and They, they didn't ask for any concessions as we're talking about here. Um, and I don't even, there was no variance on that. There, wasn't, there wasn't any variances on that, so no, they met the code. Okay. Thank you for the staff report. Very complete. Any questions of staff before we open the public testimony? Okay. Does anybody want to speak in behalf of the report, in favor of the report? Anybody want to speak against the report? Yeah. Come on up. Although I understand that this is just fulfilling a state requirement that we provide space for this kind of thing, I find it scary if we change this zoning to mixed use, high density, and if someone comes in and they want all these concessions and they say, oh gee, we'll build you some high density affordable housing, we're allowed to have a really spotty, kind of ugly kind of building, I realize it will still go through planning and, and with some standards, but it really bothers me because we're going to be stuck with something here. And as the requirements come down for more and more affordable housing or moderate housing or even standard, which is pretty high, I am concerned that we're going to be stuck with something that's going to be very unpleasant. And goal one is to maintain and enhance the residential neighborhood of West Covina. And this, to me, is not anywhere near enhancing or maintaining the residential area. And again, I realize that this doesn't mean we're going to have all this residential housing put in these spots. But when you look at all these little spots, they're, they're quote, underused because there's parking lots that have some weeds in them. Well, as the economy gets better, the parking lots are going to have cars in them if we let, let it go. So that, that's one of my major concerns. But I have a secondary one that's even more important to me. There's a section in here that permits the, a house owner, homeowner, to build a second resident, residence on their property. We already have a lot of illegal second residences on properties around here that people have done without the permission. And I understand some of these are very dangerous because if you remodel your garage to be an apartment, you sometimes have real hazardous things with gas and things, and people put in a potty and stuff like that, and it isn't a desirable thing. My concern is if we make it legal, people are going to say, oh, I can build another house or I can put a, a structure, and they won't come in for permitting. And I think that, that that is a bad kind of a tone to set. I know that we need to provide housing for all of our populations, but I would really like to see it done I know this has been done with care, but I'd really like to see it done with more caution that we don't put ourselves in a box that we can't get out of or, or open a door that we can't close. Thank you very much. Uh, help me out, Steph. Isn't it a, my understanding isn't it a state law right now that you are allowed to have a second, you know, if you, if you meet the standards and all that on your property? Yes, there is state law that requires us to allow second units uh, in, some, in some form or fashion. Our code currently allows uh, with some restrictions, second units. Um, so actually, although it's in, it's in this housing element, it's not proposing any changes to, to the current right. uh, standards in the code. Right. So right now, state edict is you can't have a second home on your property if you meet but the standards. But in, in the community, most people cannot put a, 
a, a mother-in-law house or a, what, a secondary. Uh, I, I have friends who have tried this, and when they've gone through um, the procedures, they've been turned down. So I think that's, over, that's an overgeneralization to say we already have the code. It's a very specific, limited code. Okay, sorry, and thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Anybody else want to speak? I think my point on that is yes. that we're not, that, that this doesn't change the current standards. There are standards in there. Not every lot in the city is allowed to have a second unit. Um, but, but there's no proposed change here. It's, it's just quoting the fact that we do allow that. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to speak against the uh, proposal? If not, I'll close public testimony and open up the commission discussion. Who would like to start out? I'll start out. Uh, well, as is indicated in the staff report, the proposed ordinance will continue to require an applicant seeking a density bonus to file a conditional use permit. Uh, so I really don't think much is changing. Uh, we're just uh, complying with state law and offering a bonus, uh, uh, residential density bonus, uh, as required by state law. So. I don't, I, and as mentioned earlier, uh, projects have been developed in the city recently, and there was no abuse as uh, is, is of concern that that occurred. So I, I don't think any kind of abuse or negative impact will occur by uh, this code amendment. So uh, in terms of uh, the benefits of a certified housing element, being that we uh, will only have to worry about uh, staying in compliance every eight years instead of four, I think com uh, complying is a good thing. I, I don't think this is going to bring any kind of negative, uh, undue duress or hardship to the city in any way. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Commissioner Blackburn. Okay. I, I agree. I mean, I, I, first I want to commend staff for one heck of a report. Uh, if you think I read the whole thing, you're wrong. <laughs> but it seems very, very complete, and I'm sure you dotted all your I's and, and crossed all your T's and all that. So, again, I don't think it's going to be any great change of anything. I just think it's, you know, it's a good thing to have a plan. Uh, to comply with the, what the state requires, so uh, I'm definitely in favor of it. Um, I'll ask staff to read a resolution number if there's no other comments. Resolution, there are two resolution numbers, one for the general plan amendment, which is 13-5532, and the other one for the code amendment, which is 13-5533. Can we vote on both of them at the same time? Yes, okay. that's fine. Okay. Is there any other further discussion before we vote? None? Okay. Do I have a motion? I'd make the, uh, the motion that we adopt the resolution 135532 and also oh, for the two, code. 2-2. Two. 2-2 two, two and 2-3. 3-2 and 3-3. 3-2 and 3-3. 3-2 three, three. Three, three. Three, three. Three, three. Okay. Sorry. 13-5-3-3 three, three, three and 3-2 for right. the general and also the code. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Second? Second. Second. We have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 5-0. Thank you very much for the complete staff report. Okay, this takes us down to item number five, conditional use permit, number 13-10. Uh, applicant is Intercoastal, Intercoast International Training Incorporated, David Rotkin. Location 2235 East Garvey Avenue North, Covina Palm Center. Request for approval of a conditional use permit to allow the operation of a 15,125 square foot vocational school, Intercoast College, within the Covina Palm Center. May we please have a staff report? I will be presenting this report. The applicant is requesting the approval of a conditional use permit to allow the operation of a vocational trade school 
known as Intercoast College in the Covina Palms Center. The center is located on the northeast corner of Hollenbeck and West Garvey Avenue North. The shopping center is adjacent to the residential development on the north and east. The freeways to the south and you have some office and a little bit of residential over here. The subject tenant space is 5,125 square feet and is located in the northwest, northeasterly corner of the shopping center. And that's what this shading is representing there. Um, the shopping center provides 262 parking spaces on site. The subject tenant is classified as a business school and requires 40 parking spaces based on two spaces per employee and two spaces per student. The applicant has proposed a maximum of 14 staff and 65 students per session. The front, the front of the tenant space faces onto the parking lot. No exterior changes are proposed for the, the tenant space, so it continues to look as it does in the photo. The interior of the tenant space would include a reception area, offices, testing rooms, storage rooms, restrooms, separate faculty and student lounges, classrooms, a computer lab and an HVAC lab, and an electrical lab. During the busiest times, the facility consists of seven instructors, 65 students, and seven office support staff. I don't have the most recent information on here. Um, and I don't think our applicant is here tonight, but I did speak with him this afternoon, so I'm not sure why he, they're not here. But um, there was a typo on the, uh, on the staff report and on the information they provided to us about the hours of operation. They'll be open five days a week. Our hours of operation will be Monday through Friday, 745 to 1215, as indicated in the staff report. But they'll also be there Monday through Friday from 1 to 6 and then also Monday through Thursday from 6.15 to 10.45. So for most of the week, from Monday through um, Thursday at least, they're going to be there um, a good part of the day. But I think that what uh, the, the reason for the confusion is I think they have different kind of, the, the information in the staff report was more instruction. I think maybe the afternoon classes are more lab. At least that's the understanding I gained when I talked to the applicant this afternoon. Students will attend the school four to five times a week to receive instruction for four to four and a half hours. The applicant estimates that 40% of the students will use a, a personal vehicle, while a majority of the students will be dropped off, take public transportation, or use a bicycle. Intercoast College is designed to provide educational career certificates and associate's degree programs to prepare students to succeed in medical, legal, business, and other technical industries. They currently operate in West Covina at another location, which they're relocating from to this one as well as throughout California and other states, including Maine New and New Hampshire. Intercoast College programs are approved and acknowledged by the California Bureau for Private Post-Secondary Education, as well as the U.S. Department of Education, and accredited by the Accrediting Council for Continuing Education and Training. Um, this site, just a few meetings ago, we had another um, tenant that was relocating to this site, um, four-wheel parts, I believe. And um, it is kind of a difficult site because of the way it's sited and the fact that there's not any freeway, easy freeway access to it. So it, it, this, we, we believe this is a good fit for this site and will um, uh, be in some symbiosis with the neighboring uses and will be good for the city of West Covina. So staff is recommending that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution approving conditional use permit number 1310 to allow the trade school at the site. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I guess I should uh, make one other um, suggestion is that with the updated information that we received yesterday on the hours of operation, I would suggest we modify the conditions of approval that are in the RESO. And if you're in, in agreement with that, do, do so at the time of the um, motion. That concludes my staff presentation. Any questions of staff? I Mr. have Rocker. a question. Uh, did I understand you, Jeff, to say that they were closing their location on West Covina Parkway? That is my understanding, yes. They're relocating from there to this site. So they're not, okay. Thank you. Commissioner Menefee? Yes, Jeff. Uh, the concern that I have is relative to traffic. I know it's not necessarily a planning commission issue, but we're putting several uh, uh, approvals together on use of that property and there's a driveway 
shown on the diagram uh, that's just north of where East Garvey intersects Holland and Quebec. It's right up, right up there, yeah. right there. Yeah. And yeah. there is currently a, a problem. It's a driveway. That's the only way you can get in other than over on Garvey. So people come in and around yes. there uh, often. And we're already getting back up traffic across East Garvey. That's a signal light. And so my is concern is, yeah, my concern is how we can get somebody to take a look at that. It may be that we, we need to constrain some egress uh, and ingress to East Garvey Road. I've, I've just seen some terrible problems right, right at that point, uh, even though there are two lanes that are going north. Yeah. I think um, so. The city does have a traffic committee that looks at um, periodically at different street intersections and interchanges and uh, signal lights and that kind of thing to determine if they're functioning correctly. If there needs to be changes made. Uh, we could, we could um, ask that they um, consider that or look into that. Um, that's more of a request, not a, not a direct, you know. Right. We're so, you're sort of parallel with them, so you can't, um, you can't, you, I can't direct them, but we could certainly bring that up as an issue of concern okay. and see if they have got, they may have gotten some other requests and maybe some they need to just look at that area in a, in a general sense. I think it's wonderful that we're utilizing the space that's been sitting there uh, semi vacant for so long, right. but I'm also concerned that at some point we're going to have so much traffic uh, that we're going to create another problem for ourselves as a city. And so I wish that we could uh, could do that. What I what I'll do in that regard is I will I will speak with the uh, people in the public works who oversee that Thank and you. make that suggestion, and then they'll take that under advisement and go from. from there. Any other questions of staff? Commissioner Bowers? Yeah, I, Jeff, do you have any idea what ages they, they are gearing to for the students? I is this going to be like an adult school? Yes, this is definitely an adult school. I, my guess is the ages are, are, are sort of what you would expect from a, a college or a training vocational starting anywhere from 18 going up probably could go up you know, even up to 50s or 60s, I suppose. But I imagine that the main portion of it is in the 18 to 30. Okay. Anyone else? No? Okay. Close the staff part, open up the public testimony. Is anybody here who want to speak in favor of the project? Anybody want to speak against the project? Okay, we'll close up the public testimony, open up to commission discussion. Who would like to start? I'll start. Uh, well, I would have liked for the applicant to be here. I just had a few uh, questions out of curiosity, but it looks like a good use of the space. Um, and it's, uh, I think it'll be useful in the community as well, based on uh, topics they'll be teaching, computers, HVAC, uh, medical, legal, business. Um, I think it's a, it'll be a good addition. Hopefully they can make a name for themselves and and attract a uh, steady supply of students and get them ready to participate in our local economy. No, I, I think it's a welcome addition. That, that center has just been a, a people moving in and out of there and, and uh, it really looks bad. Uh, I'm glad we, we just approved the uh, automotive facility going in there where the insurance company was there at south end of the property uh, the blue line and it goes around that property in the back on the north that's an alleyway as it is on the uh, on the east side that's an alley behind the buildings in other words you if you drive back there you can't park back there it's just a a way of driving around the facility but i agree with commissioner menifee that that uh, when that tire store, uh, for lack of a better word, goes in, it's going to make their one driveway 
uh, kind of blocked up, and then you have the other driveway going out onto Hollenbeck. So they, they should, uh, hopefully the uh, traffic committee will look at it. I don't think there's going to be any problem with parking because um, there isn't anybody else in that facility right now. I mean, they had gyms in there, they moved out. They had some other insurance, company, they moved out. So hopefully that'll start something where more people will want to move in there, but it's, it's just kind of a, I don't know, an out of, out of the way facility. So I welcome them going in. Uh, I, like I say, I wish the uh, applicant was here because I'm wondering why they wanted to move, if they're running out of space or uh, if they're, you know, if, what the reason is. I don't know if they explained that to you, Jeff, why they wanted to move. But I'm glad they're going in over there. Of course, it'll leave another vacancy where they're moving out of. So anyway, I'm in favor of the project. So uh, if nobody else wants to make a comment, I'll ask for the resolution. No. The resolution number here, there's one for the conditional use permit resolution. It's 13-5534. That's correct. Just one? Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to adopt resolution number 13-5534? Mr. Chairman, I move approval. Mr. Chairperson? Uh, we also need to make the amendment to the resolution. Yes, that's correct. Can you repeat the hours that we yeah, the they, hours? So we need to change the hours because it um, was made clear that, that the, the oh, hours they, they originally gave us were not correct. So the hours of operation will be Monday through Friday, 745 to 1215 and 1 to 6 p.m. And also Monday through Thursday, 6.15 to 10.45. Okay, so a motion has been accepted for 13.5534 with the amendment as so read. Second. Second. I have a first. I have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Okay, that brings us to study session, code amendment initiation, vaping and smoking lounges. Getting a staff report, or, or what? Who's going to do that, Jeff? <laughs> and I do have one card that someone wants to speak after. I will make this presentation. The planning department received a correspondence from A.J. Bonsall requesting consideration of a code amendment to allow a retail vapor store and lounge, and that's attached as attachment two, and you may recall that this was reviewed by, the, or the study session was held by the Planning Commission on July 9th, 2013. At the conclusion of that study session, the Planning Commission asked staff to review requirements of surrounding cities, so that's what we've been doing. Um, and just to kind of refresh everyone's memory, um, there are three types of lounges that were under discussion at that time. The first was the uh, vaping or e-cigarette uh, lounge. The vaping devices are reusable and, are, and there are a variety of flavors and types of liquid vapor that can be used with the vaping devices. Um, there's additional information in the staff report I won't go over at this point in time. We also had um, cigar lounges, which operate in a similar manner um, with individuals purchasing cigars and smoking in a lounge setting as they relax. And then lastly, we talked about hookah. <coughs> hookah lounge or bars establishment where Patrons share flavored tobacco from communal hookahs um, placed on each table. And um, hookah is usually tobacco based, but there are also herbal alternatives available. So that kind of gives you the uh, summary of, of, of the items under consideration. Based on that Planning Commission discussion, staff contacted seven surrounding cities inquiring as to whether they allowed these types of uses. So before you on the overhead is the, the seven cities. Most of them don't allow smoking lounges. Two of the seven cities currently allow smoking um, lounges. The city of Duarte allows it with a conditional use permit, and the city of Glendora um, prohibits it as a primary use, but allows it as accessory use. In other words, it can't be a standalone. It can be part of a restaurant or a, I, I'm not sure what else it would be part of, but, it, but a restaurant <coughs> is the one thing that comes to mind. But, um, but it couldn't be on its own only a smoking lounge or a, a vaping lounge. It's interesting that two of these cities currently have moratoriums on smoke shops. Mm -hmm. So just to be clear on that, there are moratoriums on smoke shops, not on lounges. The issues, they are very similar, basically the issues with the type of merchandise that they're finding available in these 
these the smoke shops, which there's a concern about um, uh, the type of materials sold maybe leading to things that, that are, aren't good for the youth in the community and that um, and that there are sale of things that are not uh, the drug paraphernalia and that kind of thing. So that's why the moratoriums are in effect currently in uh, Dewarty and uh, Covina. In looking at those um, other cities too, none of the surveyed cities made a distinction between traditional smoking lounges and e-cigarette lounges. So they kind of put them all under the same category. <clears throat> so most of them don't allow them at all, so they didn't really need a category, they just don't allow them. But the two that do allow didn't have any distinction between those the types of uses. Also just wanted to um, give you a status of SB, I guess Senate Bill 648, which I think uh, our city attorney John Lamb uh, brought to your attention at that meeting. The state legislature is currently evaluating a change to legal requirements for e-cigarettes relating to cigarettes and e-cigarettes with the intent to regulate the use of electronic cigarettes to the same extent and in the same way as cigarettes and other tobacco products. The bill was passed in the state senate on May 24, 2013 and is sent to the assembly and is currently being reviewed by the assembly committee on governmental organizations. Really hard to tell how that, how long that process might take. Um, their process isn't quite as, as simple as our process is here. So just just know that there, there is that discussion and that, that is an ongoing uh, mm -hmm. consideration. The written request is before you is to allow for vapor or vaping lounges. However, staff has received inquiries regarding uh, other similar types of businesses. A resolution to initiate the code amendment, code amendment is attached should the commission desire to consider amending the code at this time. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Just to make sure, the Senate uh, extends a law prohibiting, right? The Senate passed that? Yes, that's okay. right. But the Assembly, is, it's at the Assembly right now? That's correct. Okay, okay. And after that, one thing I do know, it has to be signed by the Governor. Right. That, that's about all I understand about the state. Any process. other questions of staff? Do, do we have any idea, Jeff, of the contents of that bill as relates to, you know, it's easy, easier I would think to regulate a pack of cigarettes by regulating the content of the, the amount of tobacco. The e-cigarette issue that we talked about last time that remains an issue for me is that there's a space for the vaporizing material to go into. And the issue of concern that I have is what would be put into that space. Uh, and, and I don't know how you would control that because I think when the e-cigarette is sold, it's empty. So you have to put something in there. And where you're going to get whatever it is you're going to put in there remains my great concern. If I can respond to that. Currently, the bill does not actually get into the regulation of the contents. It's more of... Um, legally how do you treat people who smoke e-cigarettes versus people who smoke regular cigarettes and as you know there's a lot of state laws and recently cities are getting involved where they prohibit smoking a certain amount of distance uh, from a public building and so what, what what this bill tries to do is says well you can't smoke traditional cigarettes and you can't smoke e-cigarettes close to these buildings it doesn't really get into the area of prohibiting them or making determinations that they're more dangerous or less dangerous. Um, I think that's left for another battle later down the line. And, and I guess just to, to clarify too, from what little I know about e-cigarettes, there are e-cigarettes that are self-contained. That you buy the, the, the plastic e-cigarette and when it's done you throw it away. So it's just like a regular cigarette. And then there are vaping devices, which is what you're describing, which I guess in some ways it's like a pipe. You know, you can put whatever you would, whatever you, whatever would burn in a pipe. So it, it's kind of the same. But there's two different types when you talk about e-cigarettes. And the, and the hookah is something that you put in the unit to smoke off of. That's correct. And there, that, that, I think there's usually water involved. It's water, but there is a content of something that you put that in. That you put in there, that's right. I have a uh, question, Jeff. Do we have any... Uh, vapor lounges that are being operated at this time in West Covina? Not legally. Not lounges. We do have smoke shops. We have smoke shops that allow 
smoking in their shop? That would be a lounge, no. We allow retail smoke shops. I can't guarantee that every single one of those retail smoke shops is abiding by what their business license application stated and was approved for, but no, we, we have not approved any, any smoking or vaping lounges to date. I think there's, uh, and I don't know if that would be code enforcement or whatever, but there's uh, one of the e-cigarette places that we have in the city that uh, has couches set up and TVs and allow smoking in there. So I, I wondered if that was, if we did, is that, a, is that a conditional use permit on something like that, if a lounge were allowed? Well, if the, if the, if the city, Planning Commission City Council, determines that they would like to allow a lounge, then the question is what process, that'll be up to the city to determine what the process is. And just from, from what's before you on the screen, that's what Duarte determined. They determined that the best process was for a conditional use permit. Actually, Glendora determined that they didn't need a, I don't think they even have a discretionary process as long as it's an accessory use. So two different determinations on how to, to, to regulate. Okay. When you say retail, you're talking about go in and buy a That is correct. Anyone else? Yeah. I know that now they're doing some investigation on regards to the cigarettes, even within the schools. It's been on the news that uh, the schools are trying to do something about it because, like uh, the doctor mentioned, that there is a space there where they can in, uh, put in a different type of a liquid in there, and the schools are not aware now, or they want to find out how can they go about to determine whether if it's legal to, to sell or to have the students uh, using that, that's, that viper there within the grounds because of the damage that they're doing to their lungs. So. I do have a card here that someone wants to speak for uh, the hookah, coffee shop with a hookah, and that's John Farrah. Would that come up, Mr. Farrah? Thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, to hear me out. So, Jeff Anderson did a really good job explaining. Um, a, a hookah is basically a water pipe, and uh, you put tobacco on the top, and then it's got a hose coming out, and you basically smoke the tobacco. Um, generally speaking, um, hookahs are, are not very... Uh, uh, Addictive. Um, I used to be a cigarette smoker. Uh, the average cigarette has between 7 milligrams and 23 milligrams of uh, nicotine, whereas the average serving of uh, tobacco in, in hookah has uh, half a milligram of nicotine. Um, the e-cigarettes, uh, you can buy them. They usually come between, you know, they usually come packed with between 16 and 32 milligrams of uh, nicotine per e-cigarette. Um, uh, I'm not really too familiar with that, but uh, I know when I started quitting smoking, I started you know, uh, smoking the e-cigarettes and it really didn't help me out much. Um, I had more cravings actually. Anyway, um, as far as the hookahs go, um, I haven't really pinpointed a particular location just because of the fact that when I spoke to Mr. Anderson, he told me that um, you, you guys are still, you know, trying to see if it fits into your code or not. Um, one thing that, that I'd like to do that's different than most of the hookah places that you see uh, throughout Southern California is that I'd like to have it be a, a, a coffee shop setting, similar to like a Starbucks or Coffee Bean, um, with, you know, I guess small bakery items and a gelato bar, and then... Uh, if, if you want to order a hookah, then you would come to the counter, present your ID, we'd scan your ID, and then we'd give you the hookah, kind of like a, a supermarket where, you know, we actually see your ID. A lot of the hookah shops or a hookah restaurant, you know, restaurants that have, that have hookah um, in the surrounding cities, the way it is is, uh, you know, you just sit at a table 
and you order some food and then you order a hookah. And um, you could have a guy that's 18, 18 or over, he might order a hookah, but his buddy might smoke it. And he's sitting at the same table. Here, we'll, you'll be liable because we're scanning your ID. So if anything does happen like that, uh, you will be held liable. And I'm sure you know nobody wants to be held liable for somebody else's actions. It's a thousand dollar fine and it's a misdemeanor. So um, as far as, so because there is no city regulations in, in the city of West Covina, um, there wasn't city regulations in the city of Arcadia as well. And uh, a friend of mine actually spoke in front of the city and he's, you know, he's, he basically what they told him was there was no city regulations. So he would abide by, you know, county, state, federal laws um, as far as smoking goes. And that's what he, he did uh, in the city of Arcadia. Um, a positive impact that we'll have in the city of West Covina is A, there really isn't anything like this. Um, the second thing is, you know, more sales, more sales tax, more employment. Um, we, we, want, we want to bring something new to the city of West Covina, something that's vibrant. And to be honest with you, we don't want the kids. Uh, that's something that we'd like to avoid. I mean, we're, we're looking at the 30 plus crowd. So if you guys have any questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer. Uh, I've been to a couple of places where they have the uh, hookahs, and usually it's uh, it's it's shared by two, three, four people. Is that yeah. correct? How many people can share a? Well, you know, it's generally the way it works is, I guess, as long as the hose reaches them, he could smoke, okay. right? But um, we we would like to refrain from having that. I mean, I guess we the way we want to do it is one hookah is good for two persons. Okay. Um, and actually what we want to do is, is something different than any other hookah place. When you go to these hookah restaurants, the way they actually do it is they, they give you a hookah and then they bring you a hose that 500 other people smoke from. And that's pretty disgusting. The way we want to do it is, you know, every time somebody smokes out of the hookah, we'll wash it, we'll sanitize it. And then when you order a hookah, we'll, we'll, bring, we'll bring out a disposable hose that's sealed and we'll give it to you. And you put it in, and then you know once you're done smoking, um, you're free to do as you like with it. You could take it home, or you could throw it in the trash. It's up to you. And that's actually good because it it helps reduce the spread of viruses, um, you know, flu, w whatever it is. So we'd like to approach and do something sanitary and different. Um, and I'm just curious, what what's the cost on uh, to use a hookah for? They they generally charge, you know, anywhere from ten to twenty dollars per use. Um, we we would probably be around ten dollars in the beginning, and maybe have happy hour specials, you know, seven eight bucks between you know five and eight p.m. or something. But our our whole thing is that, you know, we'd like to be open late. And we want to have all the sports channels. And so that's primarily why we want the 30 plus crowd. We're not going to have any alcohol on site, but you know, there's, there's a lot of people that want to go and watch sports, but they don't want to go to a bar. They don't want to drink. They don't want to get drunk. And then, you know, when you go to a bar, generally when there's people drinking, there's fights and there's arguments and they don't want to put up with that. So this will be something different. You can go have a coffee and watch the game and you can't do that at any Starbucks. So, thank you. Why would you want to do this? I just don't understand. I, I really don't. Can you make that much money that you could pay for your rent and all that? Just, you know, oh, offering yeah. this? I mean, I, I can't imagine somebody going in and giving you $20 to smoke out of a I just, you know, I'm not familiar with it, so I don't, I don't understand it. And where do you get the content to put into the hookah? Do you supply that? Yeah, there's there's a lot of manufacturers out there. You know, there's there's a lot of companies that that provide hookah tobacco. It's it's uh, it's controlled federally. I mean, it's not just a fly-by-night operation where we make it in the back or something. This is something that's you know sealed in, and we buy it at a at a wholesale 
outlet and you know it's it's all these people have paid their taxes and, and whatnot um, it, I guess it could be profitable but we're not planning to have just hookah I mean it's going to be a coffee shop a gelato bar and hookah so it's going to be a cafe with hookah it's not just going to be primarily hookah so that's that's not that's not where all our, our profits are going to come in from I mean that's just one of the ways we're going to generate profit. When, when you use the hookah, and I know it goes through water and all that, but you inhale the smoke that comes out of it or the content, isn't that smoke? And when, and when you uh, breathe it out, isn't there smoke goes out? Yeah, it, it is smoke, but it's it's kind of, um, it's not governed, you know, federally and statewide, it's not governed the same as a cigarette. It's governed like a cigar. Uh, cigar has separate taxes and separate everything than cigarette. Uh, generally speaking, you know, cigars don't have the manufacturing taxes that cigarettes have, and it's just, it's, yeah, I, I'm not I, I, I know it's pretty I just much don't the same, but it's it. different. And I'm glad that you're here that we can yeah. ask these questions to somebody that's more familiar with it. So if I'm sitting here having a gelato or a cup of coffee, somebody sitting next to me with a hookah, the smoke is going. Yeah, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really bother you like a cigarette, because the thing is, when the smoke comes at you, it smells like, you know, the flavor that the person's smoking. Generally, they'll smoke like apple or orange or whatever it is. <laughs> and it smells like an orange. Like, it's like a scent of, it's kind of like orange potpourri. What's, so, what's stopping somebody from putting an illegal content in that? Well, we're going to have a lot of employees. So, you know, one thing is that. So what are you going to do if somebody puts something illegal in there and starts smoking? 911. Have them on speed dial. Um, th there's a lot of successful venues out there. I mean, there's places all over San Fernando Valley that have been doing this for a long time and if, if they're able to to you know to watch over their customers and and make sure that that's not happening I'm sure we could do that as well um, chances are once you you know usually you put a piece of foil on top where the tobacco goes in a, in, a, in the bowl and usually that that piece of foil it's pretty flat once you remove that foil and put it back on you can kind of tell that it's been tampered with so I mean, if, if, if we ever feel that somebody's tampering with it, I guess we'll put a sign up that says we have the right to, you know, refuse anybody's business so they won't be coming back. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, don't, I, yeah, I think some of the restrictions now, I think some of the, isn't there a couple of beaches now that you can't even smoke cigarettes on, that they've restricted it to, from smoke, you know, I, they're getting more restrictive all the time. And, you know, like I say, if he's having a gelato and I'm on a hookah, I don't care if it's apple, orange, or whatever. Yeah, uh, I don't like smoke in my face. Th there's another thing we could do. I mean, th I guess it's endless possibilities. Uh, we haven't picked the particular location yet, but we could have a smoking and non-smoking section. Um, I, I know that it's difficult outdoors because there is wind and there's, you know, there's a lot of variables. But at the end of the day, uh, if you're sitting directly, you know, next to somebody who's smoking, and that smoke hits you and you're not a smoker, I guess it'll bother you. But uh, if you're 10 or 15 feet away and it kind of, you know, it kind of dies down by the time it gets to you. Um, but like, like I said, hookah is not like a cigarette. It's more of a social thing. And uh, it doesn't really have that, that odor that the cigarette has. Uh, I, I'm an ex-smoker and I can't sit next to, you know, cigarette smokers anymore. I know. And I used to yeah. smoke two packs a day. Let me ask you a question. If you you don't have this business yet, but would you still open your business as a coffee shop and gelato and all that if you didn't have hookah? Yeah, I mean that, that's one thing we're looking at. It's uh, but the whole thing with the hookah is that you know it's really hard to compete with somebody like Starbucks or Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf uh, or sure. you know it's a grind or Pete's Coffee. I mean you just can't compete with them. And now McDonald's is serving the same thing, so. If, if that was the case, I mean, it it really have to be a prime location for, for us to do something like that. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I can't afford Third Street Promenade rents. I mean, I've looked into it. It's, you know, anywhere from twelve to 15000 a month. And uh, like you said, I mean, at the end of the day, we're trying to make a profit. So yeah. at $15,000 a month, it's impossible. I mean, selling coffee and, and, and uh, gelatos to make, you know, after you pay your employees and your overhead, you're at 25000 a month. Where's the profit? Someone like Starbucks who has a, a reputation, you know, they'll, they'll make it. And so someone like I, like myself, cannot compete with them. Um, I, I'm a small business owner. So basically, hookah would just be another 
another small profit that, that I'd be making. So I'd have to really sit down and work the numbers to know whether I'd like to do that or not. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you letting me ask you these questions because no you know, I'm in the dark about this thing. I really am. I don't really if, know which way to go. If, if you guys, uh, I'm not trying to bribe anybody, but if you guys would, would like to go somewhere, <laughs> I, I'm, more than, I'm more than happy to take you guys, show you guys around, you know? Thank you very you, you much. You guys pay for yourselves, though, huh? so it's not a bribe. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions for Mr. Fry? Uh, yeah, just so to clarify, you're saying it's just about differentiation from the standard Starbucks or coffee bean or anything like that in order to compete. That's why you want that angle. Yeah, I, I mean, it, that's that's one of one of the reasons why. I mean, you know. You can't compete with Starbucks. I mean, it's it's nearly impossible. We've seen a lot of a lot of a lot of people do that, and you know, Starbucks comes in and opens up across the street, and they they're closed six months later. Um, so yeah, that's that's primarily why. Uh, and the second reason why is because, to be honest with you, there's nothing like that around here, and uh, you know, they go hand in hand. The reason why we'd like to open. The hookah with the coffee shop is because you can, it's like a it's like a quick service counter, uh, it's like a counter service. You, you can show up and, and purchase at the counter. I could scan your ID, and it's not like uh, the city of Glendora where you go to these restaurants and you sit down and you know um, Paul can order and I could smoke it and you know every every time the guy walks around I give to Paul, the guy doesn't know I'm smoking. Um, in this scenario. Paul's held liable if he orders it because I'm scanning his ID and, and that's on file. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? The only thing I'd like to say is if, if it was really a good profit maker, why wouldn't Starbucks and the rest of them do it? Well, uh, Starbucks... Once it's legal, once, if it's legalized and there's money to be made, I could see them doing the same thing. It would be real competition for you, too. Star Starbucks has a hold on us in a different way. Everybody drinks coffee. It's addictive, as you know. But what Starbucks does is they have farms all over the world that are, you know, they're buying the coffee for $2 a pound, and they sell it to us for $15 a pound. And then when we show up, we buy a cup of coffee. It's two fifty a cup. So trust me, if I could do what Starbucks is doing, I wouldn't be doing this. I would be doing that. I'm more, I'm more happy. I'm happier doing that. You make a lot more money, you know. Thank you. You had a question, sir? There are... Two places in Glendora that have the hookah there's facilities a, now, one on uh, Route 66? Uh, there's a few places, actually. There's a, a place called Eden Garden Cafe. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> yeah, it's on Route yeah. 66, and I, for, I forget what the cross street is. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's very close to Lone Hill. There's another location that's uh, on Barranca and Route 66. And then there's two other locations on Route 66. Between One's on Brand, Brand and Route, Brand. Route 66. And then there's another one that's uh, just east of Eden Garden. Okay. So there's four locations now. In, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else? Thanks for taking the time to listen to me. Have a great day. Thank you. Well, Mr. Planning Commissioner, <laughs> Jeff, where we go from here? Well, the question before you is um, whether you want to initiate a code amendment, and that would be to allow you to consider possibility of, of allowing these type of uses. And commissioners? I don't. <coughs> I haven't Betty, heard anything. Betty, you're shaking your head. I haven't heard anything or read anything uh, between last meeting when we discussed this and now that would lead me to believe any differently. The, the medical scientists at the very fairest assumption say it's too early to tell. And my bias is if it's too early to tell, I want to wait and see. So I, my preference would be not to do anything. Commissioner Valles. Yes, I, uh, I'm very much against it. One of the thing is that because we, we take pride here in West Covina of being a friendly uh, family type of a city welcoming children and it, you know just to make money um, to have a business just for the profit of making money and not for the interest of the health of the youth um, I, I just and there's too many negative 
uh, opinions about this, so I am very much against it. Thank you. Commissioner Blackburn? <clears throat> Blackburn? No comment. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to ask staff. I mean, as, as far as the code amendment goes, I mean, should we be? I mean, I completely agree with the health aspects that come with uh, considering this, but should we be incorporating uh, the health aspects or medical aspects that have yet to be decided into uh, deciding whether or not we want to uh, initiate a code amendment? I mean, I. You know, that, I think that's the, the crux of the matter here is, is we've got a lot of variables in place here interacting with each other and uh, I think we uh, maybe need to separate them and look at them individually, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know that, that I would feel comfortable opining on a medical aspect of what e-cigarettes or hookah or vaporizers, um, what they do to, to anybody and, you know, whether or not they choose to partake in that kind of activity. Uh, so, you know, I, I, think, I think that's a factor that maybe we need to possibly consider separating, if possible, to look at. Um, you know, whether or not we want to initiate the code amendment. Well, sometimes we have things before us that we're, we're hamstrung with what we can do. And we just had that. The last, the last hearing was on a uh, code amendment the state requires us to do. We don't have, really have a choice. We can talk about it. We can, we can complain about it. But either we're going to adopt it and get a housing element certified or we're not going to adopt it and not get a housing element certified. That's, we have other things like... Um, Wireless, wireless telecommunication facilities that are that the federal law has stated that you cannot consider health impacts because the science isn't there to say that if it's good, bad, or any, anything in between. But there are other uses like this one that's before us that it's really totally up to the community to decide at their own for whatever reasons. There's nothing. There would be nothing wrong with considering potential health impacts or the fact that there aren't any. Uh, studies that really have determined exactly um, if there are or aren't, um, or if the city it determines that they don't think that's an issue and determines that they'd like to allow them, like some of the other cities we talked about, that's, that's fine too. It really is totally up to the community to establish in this circumstance what they think are the priorities and, 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 and if they think it's appropriate or not appropriate. So I understand what you're saying, that there are different issues and you all may have a different issue that you're, that you're focusing on, but it's really the, it's the community and, and you guys at this point are representing the community um, that determines if, if um, it's appropriate use or not. Yeah, I'm, personally, I'm, I'm sensitive to smoke and allergens and uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of things of that nature, but I want to be careful not to uh, overreach, I guess, and, and make sure that I'm uh, giving uh, potential uh, businesses a, a fair shake, but still uh, emphasizing the fact that uh, the public should be aware and notified of any kind of potential risks involved with partaking on an activity and, and have it posted. So, uh, you know, I think um, in order to be fair to everyone, I, that I'm looking at it that way to kind of separate the two. Well, I guess where I'm coming from, we just don't know enough about this stuff. Uh, we really don't, at least I don't, and it, it sounds to me like most of us don't. There's not, hasn't been studies, there's, you know, things and questions. And then on top of it, we've got legislation up in Sacramento right now that's in process that, that's uh, uh, banning some of this stuff. So I think we need to find out, number one, what uh, legislation's gonna come out and where that's gonna come out. And then I think we need to find out more about uh, just more about these products and what they do and what they don't do. And so to, for me to say, let's pass a code amendment, at this point in time, I'm hard pressed to do that. So I'm not in favor of a code amendment at this time. Maybe, uh, Jeff, we could check with Glendora, who possibly has uh, two or three of these. I know of uh, two of them in Glendora. 
I would be interested to see if the police department had had any calls, if they've had any, any disturbances. Um, I'm not sure, but I think one of them, alcohol, the one I'm thinking of, I think alcohol is served also there. I don't know if that uh, would be an issue. But maybe we could ask the city of Glendora if they have had any comments, observations, um, or suggestions that they may want to follow, that we may want to follow their suggestions. I think the question uh, before the commission right now is that whether we should expend more time on this if we're not interested in, in, in if, if the city, if the planning commission is not interested in initiating a code amendment. We, I, I certainly could do a Commissioner Blackburn suggested I could bring that information back if you're interested in me, in, in me going to that, um, to, to, to do that. I guess I should also just let you know that there, there's no standard length of time on an initiation. I mean, I think I, I don't know if I had it in this report, but in the previous report I let you know that several years ago the Planning Commission looked at this, this issue and decided they didn't want to initiate a code amendment. So they came to that decision two or three years ago might come a decision this year and next year maybe they come to a different decision. So all, all those things are that, that you know, just because a decision is made now doesn't mean it's going to, it's going to stay that way forever. So I guess that my question is more at, at, in, at, to fulfill Commissioner uh, Blackburn's thought there whether we should go forward or if you want to make a vote on make a vote take a vote to either not go forward or to ask for further information. Well let me ask a question even if Glendora <coughs> let's say allows this without we may not in this city allow alcohol and the same thing so but you just want to find out if there's been any disturbances or anything yeah okay what's the pleasure of the commission do I have a motion well, Mike, I'd move that we uh, set this matter aside yeah it sounds like maybe we need to uh, gather more information maybe uh, look at more and consider more we have the first motion just to be to clear set it aside means not to initiate a code code amendment amendment. This time. correct so we have one motion I think um, Dario you mentioned I think you're trying to submit a second motion for oh, no, I, was, I was agreeing oh, okay so we have a first and a second all in favor aye aye five oh uh, now is this something that's appealable no because it's not no, it's not really appealable, uh, although the Planning Commission and City Council both have the ability to initiate a code amendment. So right. just the Planning Commission. So, so we just voted not to You just voted not amendment. to initiate the code amendment at this time. Okay. And if, and if it comes up, you know, if something comes up again, we'll certainly bring it back to you. And we may have further information at that time, depending on what the state does or if the EPA does. Okay. Not EPA, but. but Thank you. The FDA. The FDA does some. Thank you very much for coming in and let us, letting us ask all those questions. I think that would be a question you might want to give me a call on. Right now, I think they made the decision, but. R1 standards. Okay, I think that takes us to item number seven, a study session for R1 standards. You want a staff report or? And if you weren't tired of me already, you will be by the time this one. <laughs> All right. So what we have here is this um, code amendment 1303, single family standards. It was initiated uh, by the city council to the residential agricultural and single family residential development standards in the municipal code. The study session was <laughs> held by the planning commission on July 9th, 2013. The six standards to be evaluated were presented to the planning commission at that time. The six standards that we have before us are the ratio of pad size, well most of them are hillside standards, the first five, ratio of pad size to floor area, appropriate pad size, building height measurement, uh, standards and review process for decks, and common area maintenance for drainage and landscaping of slopes, those are the five hillside, and the last, the sixth, is standards for covered parking. Staff surveyed surrounding cities and obtain zoning standards. And that's the table that is in your uh, staff report as attachment one. And it's before you. I'm not going to kind of go through, I'm not going to go through this uh, at length. I just wanted to 
sort of sh uh, show you that different cities have different standards and also make you make it clear that um, you know when we did read the review that uh, many of the cities that we re reviewed um, such as Irwindale they don't have hillside areas so there's no hillside standards in those cities so this is a, a, the survey we did for ratio of pad size to floor area and appropriate pad size oh. and the second slide is the uh, building height measurement and review process for decks and balconies. The third slide is the common area maintenance for drainage and landscape slopes and standards for covered parking. I think I'll pause here just to see if there's any questions on any of that. I went through that fast. I don't know if anybody has questions on any of the standards they saw from other cities. Uh, and I, uh, no, uh, I just Chairman wanted, Holtz, I see that. I just uh, want to see some. Is it all right if I leave? I'm not feeling well. Okay, yeah, if I leave, I mean, okay. can I be dismissed? Okay, I believe we were asked if there was any questions of staff at this time. Anyone? Okay, yeah, Jeff, so you are just asking about uh, questions about the chart? I have questions in general about the items. But I'm going to go through the, the next chart. So I'm just basically asking about the survey of the cities. So that's attachment one. Attachment two, I'm going to walk through that one next. So if, if you have questions, which I, I fully hope that we have some discussion on that. Okay, yeah, attachment two. Yeah. Okay, I'll go forward. So one of the things that we have traditionally done here when we have a discussion on, an, uh, on a potential code amendment as we have looked at the, the issue and we've provided some discussion on the issue, what, what, what requirements there are. In this case, we also provided some consequences to the action. I'm not going to necessarily read those um, as I go through this orally, but they're in, the, they're in that table. And we also provide a options list, the options that we are aware of, and we provide uh, staff's recommendation. Now, obviously, that, that is our discussion. That's what we, we think is appropriate or considering it to be appropriate, but obviously, it's the planning commission that makes that determination, not staff. All right, so let's walk through the chart. So this is the, the first page of the chart, and I've tried to make the slides to be the same as what you see on the, on the pages. So if you wanted to open your um, staff reports to uh, the attachment to, you'll, you'll be able to follow pretty along easily. So number one, ratio of pad size to floor area. Currently there's a zoning standard that establishes a ratio between the lot size and the floor area of the house, and that's how we determine if there needs to be a, a review process. However, there is no zoning standard establishing a ratio between the pad size and the floor area of the house. So as we surveyed the other cities and looked at what other cities had done and, and, and did a little bit of evaluation and what also might, might be possible, we came up with three options. And most of these, option one is no change. Um, so that, that's the case here. And option two, require a maximum pad size ratio of 50%. So if you had a 4,000 square foot pad size, you would only allow 2,000 square foot footprint on that pad. Option three, require a 10 foot level access area behind each house. And that is our recommendation to consider a, a requiring a, a 10 foot level area as emergency access area behind each house to allow for access and to, and to reduce encroachment into slope areas. So that's a thought. Um, I, I believe that one came from Walnut. Walnut has a similar standard as that. All right, I will go to number two, appropriate pad size. The concern is that some of the pads, and this one we're specifically talking about the, the pads in the South Hills area. The concern is that some of the pads may be too small to allow for large houses in a level yard area. The pad size was approved as part of the track map subdivisions and through the grading plan. So they're all in existence up there. Option one is no change. Option two would be to modify the code to require a minimum pad size for hillside lots. Staff is, is recommending option one, no change. Uh, because the pads were approved as conditions of approval and a gra grading has been completed, the change, any change to the zoning code would not affect the South Hills parcels. And furthermore, the city is, is 
pretty much all been um, subdivided out. So we're unlikely to have any, or any extensive at least, um, subdivisions on hillside lots at this stage in, in West Covina's history. So that's our recommendation there. I will pause one more time. If, if, maybe I'll pause between each page if there's questions. In, in relation to that, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> So as far as option three uh, on number one, uh, yes. the 10-foot the level access area, that's just, you know, on hillside lots, uh, that, that you're recommending that as an option just for safety, like public access? Well, it, it, it is stated as safety, although this is a zoning code. It's not a safety code. No. Okay. So it, it does two things. One of them is that it provides access for public safety to get around behind the house. There's not, there's not a hillside back there. Um, okay. The other thing it does, though, is it, produ it provides that separation between the slope area, so it pushes the house away from the slope. Now, I, I guess I have to say that, um, you know, there's a lot of, well, most of the pads, most of the lots, the vacant lots that we see out there today have pads, and they were developed with pads to allow for enough room to build a house on. But we do have lots in the city that have a very small pad and the houses are currently developed over the slope that wouldn't meet this. So while we think that's a good idea, we, I think we all have to understand that there's a lot of lots out there that, that are going to they're not going to meet this standard no matter if we pass it or not because they've already been developed, they've already been graded, they don't have enough pad size to allow for that 10 foot area behind. Uh, to, uh, to me, 10 foot is, doesn't seem like that much. It's not that much, but it, it is really enough isn't. to to, to sort of walk around the house. Because right. I know I've seen some homes in, I think, Covina and all that, where you keep seeing the, the hill starting to slide away, you know, from erosion and stuff. So that 10 foot doesn't give you much between the house and the erosion. You know, I, I, is, uh, who came up with the 10 foot, I guess? Is <laughs> well, that's a good question. <coughs> I, 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 um, when we did the research, we found that Walnut has that that standard, and that would be on uh, that would be on page one of the attachment one. It shows their standard. So I'm going to say Walnut came up with a standard. Mm -hmm. well, uh, the I, one one difference between Walnut and West Covina is that Walnut has mostly been developed, you know, in the 70s and 80s, whereas West Covina had a lot of subdivisions well before that. So it may be that Walnut had that standard in ever since they started mm -hmm. subdivisions and became a city which would be very different. It's very different to, to put in a standard before you develop than to try to institute one after. Am I the only one that thinks 10 foot is not very much? No, I, I agree. I think uh, more would be a little bit safer and wiser. Um, now, as, uh, as far as um, how, how would the existing structures be affected? They would be exempt from? Yeah, existing structures that are already built would be um, legal nonconforming, so they wouldn't be required to comply. So if we made it larger than 10, that, that would only be going forward? It would only be on it, either additions or rebuilds or new, new, um, new structures. Well, it's the Commission's pleasure. I have a question on uh, some of the... What, what I'd suggest is not necessarily coming to a conclusion right now. Let's ask the questions. I know we have, we have some people in the audience that might wish to speak. So rather than come to a conclusion at this point, I'd suggest asking questions. Let me go through the whole procedure, and then we come back after you let the public have a chance to speak, then you uh, okay. provide. I know, uh, Jeff, we have some uh, pads in the city that uh, proposed having homes built on them. Have we had any plans submitted for those lots at this time? Are you talking about the South Hills? Uh -huh. Yes, we have plans that have been submitted. Have those fallen in or outside of the 10-foot? My, I, I haven't uh, reviewed those. Um, yeah, every single lot, but my my understanding is they probably would all comply with the ten foot, and may, and, and may, may, most of them probably would have much in excess of ten feet. Okay. And do you have a, a spreadsheet or just any kind of data based on the ranges and maybe the averages of pad sizes relative to these lots? I I have. In, let, let me um, let me just be clear. I there. As, as shown on the staff board, there are 79 vacant lots. I don't have information on the 79. 
I have information on a, on a percentage of those, a small percentage. Okay. Is it, do you know, is it an average representation of all the lots? That I don't know. My, okay. my gut feeling is it probably is. It probably is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd be, I'd like to know, I think that would help me in making a decision. I've been putting a lot of thought about the, uh, the ratio of pad size to floor area. Yeah. I know the unusable uh, portion of, of any of these lots, you know, we can't really take into consideration, but I am interested in, in ensuring that we don't create any kind of um, living or parking problems. Well, we'll get to that, but yeah, yeah. I, that, that would help me if okay. we have okay. that. As we, get, as we get further in that, that's one of the things you could ask. We could probably bring back further information. I will go forward then. Number three is the building height and number of stories. The current definition limits the height of houses to two stories, which is 20 and 25 feet in height. The building height for single family houses is measured from any point of the roof structure to finished gray directly below that point. So three options there. Option one, no change. Option two would be measure height, change the code, to measure height from the lowest finished gray to the highest point of the structure. Number three would be to measure from the average of the grade at the midpoint of each elevation. Those options both came from other cities. So it seems like that's one of those standards. That almost every city has a little bit different standards. It's a little bit hard to fully evaluate what they mean until you do quite a bit of math work and, and, and actually pick a lot. But in, in, in considering that option, staff is recommending option one, which is West Covina currently has a low maximum height. If you look at the standards for height from other cities, most other cities that we surveyed are um, 35 feet. There are two other cities that I think are 25 feet, but 30 and 35 feet has been more my experience as well. So 25 feet is a fairly low height limit as it is. Um, and, the, and the current method of measurement has been used for most houses in West Covina that are constructed and it seems to have worked fine. So after, after considering that, staff is recommending that no change be made to, to that standard. Number four, standards and review process for decks. The municipal code requires that decks between four feet and eight feet in height obtain the approval and administrative use from it. Decks over eight feet in height are not allowed by code and must obtain a variance. So option one is to allow an administrative use permit for decks up to 10 feet in height. In other words, make the standard um, allow for higher uh, decks. Option two in this case is no change. Option three require a 50% greater side yard setback um, and a minimum 25-foot rear yard for decks requiring the approval of administrative use permit. So that, that wouldn't change the standard, it'd still be four to eight feet, but it would set a greater setback standard than we have, than, than the code does now. So staff is recommending option three, most side yard setbacks in the hillside areas are either seven or 10 feet, so that would go to about uh, 10 and a half feet and 15 feet respectively. Decks and balconies can create issues of privacy and view impacts. Um, requiring additional setbacks can reduce the concerns. So how we've been um, reviewing decks in the past is basically treating them just like we would a, an addition. But I think as we've had some issues with some of the uh, proposals for decks recently, we've realized that, come to think that um, decks are not the same as an addition. Addition has a wall, complete separation, and as many of you have been on some committee know, you can put standards and not allow windows on that wall. So you reduce your visibility impacts into the neighboring property. Well, you can't do that for a deck. You're just creating a view platform um, that allows for easier access or visibility into neighboring property. So um, that, that, that is why we're suggesting that. And again, I'll pause there if, if there are any uh, questions or um, comments on, on three and four. Well, the rear yard setback, well, yeah, that's a very good point. Option three, we, I didn't carry through the whole of option three. Option three, if you look at the options in the options column, it's also to, to set that minimum 25-foot rear yard deck. 25-foot 20, rear yard setback for decks. So uh, you, you are correct, uh, Chairman Holtz, that it should be both side and rear. Okay, so option three with the 25-foot rear, uh, that's just from the edge of the property. 
from yes from the rear property line to wherever the deck um, and and that unusable part where the you know that's not part of the pad have there been any issues or how does it affect uh, the, the decks and, and erosion specifically I mean it, do you do we require uh, really deep footings or that's going to depend on the soil and that's going to be a building code requirement there, there's going to be a certain amount of footing that's required depending on the, the size and, and, and weight of the deck. right okay yeah so that they, they may have to have deep footings they, they may if it's a smaller deck and it, it also depends on the type of soil okay and I guess the, answer, the simple answer to that is that wouldn't change the code the building code would still require that same level of scrutiny that it okay all right good so when you say 25 yards setback in the rear here, here's the house here's the deck it's 25 from there to the rear yard to the property line yes from the from the furthest point the deck comes out yes okay yeah thank you all right I will move on to the last two So number five is common area, ma whoops. common area maintenance for drainage and landscaping of slopes. Subdivisions that are reviewed today are required to have an HOA, Homeowner Association, so that slopes are in a common area that is communally maintained and financed. Currently some of the lots in the South East area have cross lot drainage, which requires each individual property owner to maintain the drainage swales. So two options there is basically no change, and option two would be to establish a requirement in the code that hillside subdivisions have CCNRs that require common area maintenance. Staff is suggesting option one, since the tentative and final track maps have been approved by the city, any changes to the zoning code would not affect the parcels in the South Hills area. And it wouldn't affect any other parcels either that are already created. So um, while we might have a, a small subdivision here or there in the, in the hillside areas, it's unlikely that it would achieve very much. And, and that is our standard today anyway. I mean, most even the areas that we, where we subdivide in a, in a, in a flatland scenario, like on Valinda, they, they have HOAs too. So it, th that is, that's a common practice today, which wasn't a common practice in the late 70s and early 80s when South Hills was sub subdivided. Lastly, standards for covered parking. Currently, the code requires two covered parking spaces, no matter how large the house is. The code further requires two open parking spaces for each house. However, the larger the floor area of the house, the greater the number of open parking spaces that are required. So we have four options that are before that we have thought of there. Some of them come from other cities, some just are, are a thought process. Option number one, again, is no change. Option two, adopt a standard requiring three covered parking spaces when the house is a floor area greater than 4,500 square feet. Option three, adopt a standard requiring three covered parking spaces when the house has five or more bedrooms. And then the compromise, option four, adopt a standard requiring three covered parking spaces when the floor area of the house is greater than 4,500 4, square feet or uh, the house has five or more bedrooms. Is that four instead of five? It is. And I think I made a mistake too. I have option five, which we don't even have an option five. So option four is what I meant there <coughs> as a recommendation. Um, ad adopt a standard requiring three covered parking spaces when the floor area of the house is greater than 4,500 square feet or the house has five or more bedrooms, it is likely the house of this size and number of bedrooms will have more vehicles than an average size house. An average size house probably, when I'm referring to that, I'm referring to something probably between 1,700 and 2,500 square feet for the city of West Covina. So that, that's, that's our thought. It, it, um, our standard for when you have to comply, the, the zoning code standard for when you have to comply with parking is basically when, when you hit that threshold of an administrative use permit. So it has to do with either a large addition, which is generally for most lots in the city is about 1,250 square feet, or when you hit that MUSE threshold, which is 35 percent. It's a complicated kind of process, but, but that's when most of you have seen administrative use permits that come before you or have come before the subcommittee when you're subcommittee members. So that's the thresholds. It has to hit those thresholds. They're fairly large additions when, for the most part, so when that happens. That yes, but if they don't, 
if they have, if let's say you have a 1,200 square foot house, they're going to do an 800 square foot addition. Unlikely that's going to cause them to require it to go through the, but they'd, so they'd still be allowed to keep their non-conforming two car garage, which may be 18 by 18 or 18 by 20, or their non-conforming one car garage, which is probably 10 or 12 by 20. That brings me to the conclusion of my presentation tonight. Um, you know, the, the purpose here um, is to provide the Commission with a discussion and alternatives on the issues being studied. Um, so the Commission uh, either can ask for additional information, which I can bring back at a further study session, or the, the Planning Commission could come to consensus on moving forward to the Code Amendment and direct me to go and start doing some work in preparing Code Amendment language. If you're, if you're comfortable with, with the recommendations that are before you. Um, another option is that they, you may determine that a code amendment is not appropriate, which you just did in the previous one, and you can then, that would be a decision you would make. That would have to go to City Council in this case, because City Council initiated this code amendment. So it would still continue to go to them, but it would go to them with the recommendation that you didn't feel, Planning Commission did not feel that changes were necessary to the code. Um, so, our recommendation is to, for the Planning Commission to review the information and provide appropriate direction to staff regarding what, what our next step is. Uh, I agree with everything except the first item, which I mentioned before, the 10-foot, ten, ten where is it here, 10-foot? 10-foot uh, ten level area behind the house. 10-foot access behind each house. I just think that's not enough. And, and that, that would be the only thing I would suggest that uh, we come up with something larger than that. I don't know how the rest of the commission feels about that. Maybe if I might suggest something, you might want to walk through the, all six of them and take one at a time and see what everybody oh, thinks. That okay. way you can give me clear direction. All right. So you did start with number one. That's number one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we did. Uh, you may want to ask if there's anybody in the public that would like to. Oh, is there anybody in the public that would like to comment? Yes, please come up. Please state your name. Good evening. Good evening. City staff, my name is uh, Eric Sheck. I work for uh, Vandale Homes, and I'm pleased to be here tonight. I've been uh, following this uh, development standard uh, case study uh, closely. I was here last at the last meeting to speak briefly on the matter as well. I've been, uh, had the pleasure of working with Jeff Anderson to try to understand and, and um, walk through. Um, as you know from our last meeting, our, we do have 22 lots in the South Hills area that are um, impacted by the moratorium and the um, development standards that you're looking at tonight. So, so we do have a somewhat of a vested interest in understanding what, what the impacts are and, and how that works. I did just have a couple of, um, of after reading the report and listening to your discussion tonight, I did just have a couple comments, just more general comments as a, as a builder or someone in, in the industry. Um, on the comment number one about the, uh, item number one about the uh, slope erosion, um, there is a uh, safety variable which is put into place by the grading code, and it's uh, basically uh, H over two is how they, is, the, is basically how they summarize it. So depending on the, the distance of the slope and the height of the slope, a variable setback is put into place for the safety of the uh, of the slope and that setback which is established from that slope and that sets minimum distances um, regardless of whatever the uh, planning setback is as to what a, a precautionary safety uh, distance should be and in most cases um, on the larger slopes that would be more of a safety concern you'll see that they're they're going to be more than 10 feet and um, and uh, as far as decks go with within those areas um, there are requirements to strengthen those footings and, and, um, and drop those footings down into um, uh, stronger uh, reinforcing. So, so those, those conditions are already there in the, in the, in the building code uh, for that reason. So that was a, a good comment I just wanted to follow up on. Um, I did have a comment item number four, uh, which is, relates to decks. Um, one of the things that drew us uh, well to West Covina was the, was the views. Uh, the South Hills lots have excellent scenic views of the backdrop and the night, nighttime with the lighting, and it, they're, they're, they're just gorgeous, and we think that our, our homeowners are absolutely going to love and fall in love with those. Um, 
one of the things that I was talking to Jeff briefly about is is looking at uh, building separation too, and not not just looking at setback, but also because you've got, especially in South Hills, you have such a wide range of uh, uh, to topography up there because of the hillside. Just something to consider would be looking at uh, um, separation and not just a a um, uh, setback from parcel to parcel. Um, and then uh, number number six uh, related to the covered parking. Um, the code does have standards. We've been working with, uh, with Jeff uh, to understand what those standards are in relationship to the parking and um, understanding, too, that there is a, there is a code that talks about um, uncovered parking. So as the, as the home size does increase, the, um, the amount of uncovered parking, being driveway parking, um, does need to increase similar to what's being proposed for covered parking. So just one thing to consider, too, in the... In, uh, in setting in a, um, a, a code that talks about a, a third or even a fourth um, covered parking stall within a home or in a garage, um, just be sensitive to um, what that does to the curb appeal of the home and making sure that you're not creating a situation where if you have narrower lots, you're creating what I would consider a um, garage dominant uh, front elevation. Um, making sure that you know with a with a two car and possibly a tandem third or a tandem fourth, um, you can still produce a lot of architectural elements and a lot of uh, a lot of beauty in that front curb appeal. Um, so you don't have a three car wide or even four car wide garage on a very narrow lot in a narrow home. So I just wanted to to interject on that. Um, so the. And kind of in short, I, I know that you're being asked tonight to put together for a, uh, to review for a code amendment, but um, really like to see if there is, again, if there's any way that some of these can be resolved as opposed, as conditions of approval on these laws as opposed to a code amendment, and then ultimately um, move out of the moratorium to move the um, homes farther, further along. So um, do appreciate that, and, it's, um, and I just want to say thank you, and if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be available. Any questions for Mr. Sheck? <coughs> Mr. Blackburn? On uh, your lots that you have up in the hills, are any of those lots, are the slopes uh, steeper than 4 to 1, 3 to 1? Do you have any 2 to 1? Uh, most, uh, most of the slopes up there are about 2 to 1. About 2 to 1? Yes. And the length of the slope going down, uh, from the, say, one of the upper lots to the lower lot, what would that be, 30, 40, 45 feet maybe? They range. There's some that are as little as 15 feet and some that are like 35, almost 40 feet. Do you have issues with uh, concerns? Uh, I'm sure you have the soils reports and the <clears throat> so forth. Do you have concerns with drainage that might cause pop-outs or... Uh, has anything like a buttress fill ever been put in, or is it the slopes or the soil's severity? Uh, does it require any of those type of things, like a buttress fill, or a lot of those uh, measures were put in place when the when the uh, when the area was mass graded years back? And you do have the and we've plan reviewed on those. That. Yeah, we've reviewed those and and understand those. And then there were certain terrace drains that were put in along the slopes. To um, to protect the slopes from eroding and to and to protect those buttresses and, and keyways that were put in. Do you propose those. having the uh, drainage ditches? Uh, talk briefly about possibly a uh, homeowners association, or do you propose each of the homeowners to take care of their own drainage issues, or how does that? Um, just to elaborate, uh, the 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 V ditches on the in most lots in South Hills, not just the ones that we looked at, were already uh, established. So the V-ditches and much of the landscaping was um, put in on a, on a temporary irrigation system so that it would um, protect the slopes and, um, and uh, allow the vegetation to grow. So uh, again, all those improvements are already installed. No, I, I understand that. I'm wondering and if the maintenance of those, is it up to the homeowner or is it going to be a homeowner or HOA? Currently in, um, in the track next to the where we're, we're, we're building, um, the homeowners maintain their um, individual slopes. So it would be their individual. Okay. Right. And what, what could be done, as was mentioned in Jeff's uh, staff report, is the, um, 
uh, CCNRs could be put into place, regardless of whether or not there's an HOA to establish and clarify the enforcement and maintenance obligations of each homeowner and um, giving, also giving rights from one homeowner to another to um, um, enforce upon one another. But reviewing uh, the grading plans, you have no issues. You feel very comfortable with the compaction reports and s soils reports. Okay. Yeah, we did. A, we did a lengthy when we bought the lots. We did a lengthy review and hired a third party, uh, soils and civil engineer to okay. review that. Okay. And what what is the? Do you know what the average pad size is on on your lots? Uh, the average pad size is. Um, I want to say roughly about 10,000. 10,000, sorry, uh, I should have lots, asked. The lots range between 20 to 30,000. Um, but after, after looking at just the flat usable space, r average 10,000, some are larger, of course. Okay. Thank you. I just want to clarify that what Mr. Sheck was talking about were the 22 lots, not the whole 79, just so. Uh, Jeff, on the 10-foot on the, uh, level access behind the house, what I think Mr. Sheck was saying, there are some standards right now based on the slope and all that, what the average uh, setback should be, is that correct? What he was referring to is the building code. Yeah. So yes, there are some, I forget the equation he uses there, but uh, and there are some setbacks, H over two is over. So there's basically, so it depends on how far it drops off and you need to be a certain distance away. Um, there are ways to, um, with retaining walls and other types of construction though, to, to build over a slope. So uh, uh, there, are, there are standards in there, um, but you can see that, uh, that there are houses that are being but, built. But there's some standards, if you use retaining walls on it, you could address that issue and go further. Or That's less. my understanding, yes. Hmm. Any other questions, Dan? Yeah. Uh, Jeff, as far as uh, the, let me see here. For number three, for the number of stories, when, when a basement is added, uh, does that play any part in uh, the pad size, like, you know, if it wasn't there before, just that square footage addition, if it's a basement down into the slope. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect pad size. So and, pad isn't recalculated in that instance? No, okay. could, yeah, no, it's not. Okay. As long as the basement doesn't go past the pad size, though, right? Well, I think well, it would. Well, if it goes outside the pad size, it's, still, it's not on the pad, but it doesn't change the pad size. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, if you have a pad size where the house is on, and then you have a basement, and I've seen some basements that go yeah, extend outside out the, the pad size. Yes. Uh, my point there is, though, that's not changing the pad okay. size. It's just okay. pushing something like a right. deck outside the pad. Okay. All right, thank you. So it could uh, pretty much add the uh, add square footage to the house and change the ratio of pad size to uh, yes, the floor sorry. area. Basements, j just in, in, in a general sense, basements aren't, 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 I'm trying to think of the right word. You know, basements aren't the same as a, as a, as a story. If a two-story you have a basement, that means that most of the, most of that, that basement area is underground. So if you're underground, you can't meet egress windows. You're not technically allowed to have sleeping areas. And there's some other restrictions. So, so. It, it's a little bit different. They're not the same as. as, as okay, as so the what you, we, they couldn't put in like two or three bedrooms down there if they no, felt not, like. No, not not unless they could somehow meet egress. There, there may be. Well, that, that's that's yeah. Okay. It, it's not the same level of um, quality of of, of 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 floor area. I guess. That's okay. What I say. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. So I guess what I was suggesting before is maybe to walk through one, two, three, four, see if, okay. if there's an agreement among the planning commissions about each one of those, if there's additional information you'd like to get back. Well, um, let's start with number one. Any questions on number one or 
recommendations or anybody? Well, yeah, as far as uh, the 10 foot uh, access area behind each house, I, I like that. I still think maybe, like we stated earlier, 15 feet might be a little more appropriate or safe. And as far as the ratio of 50%, uh, I feel a little bit more comfortable with 45% as the maximum. So uh, that, the, that's my thought on number one. But just to be clear, um, our rec we're not rec we're, the staff is not recommending the maximum pad size ratio. That was an option, but we're not recommending it. Right, yeah, and I just, just that's, that was just my feeling on it. I got you, okay. okay. Uh, I concur with Commissioner Castellanos. I'd like to see the, the, uh, the 10 foot be extended to 15 foot. Commissioner Menefee? My concern about that would be coming up with a magic number involves some analysis of what that does to the property. Uh, and we've heard about 10, 10 feet. We understand what 10 feet will do for us or create for us. But I don't know that 15 feet doesn't create another kind of a problem. Jeff, can you clarify? Well, it's going to depend on the lot. There's almost every conceivable type of lot out there with all kinds of pad sizes from very narrow that are right up against the street to big 10, 15,000 ones that yeah. Mr. Sheck was referring to. So I don't know that I can, I can help out in that, but whether it's 10 or 15, there's going to be lots that are going to have a difficulty with that. That's what it boils down to. My, my, and so my guess would be that the, the higher you get, the higher that number is, the more lots have difficulty complying with that. Well, we're seeing a, a minimum of 15 is what we're saying. We're, you're yes. saying uh, require a 10-foot level access. We're saying a minimum of 15. Right. Because I've been in places where, you know, 10 feet is really doesn't give you any room. So I, I'd recommend 15 as Commissioner Castellanos yes. does. So, so then we're going to have an issue where we're going to have more conditional use permits or, or variances. Uh, brought to us if we have a greater uh, number of, of feet. Yes, that, that might be the case. We, well, um, if, if they know that it's 15 foot is a minimum, I mean, when you build your plans and all that, you build them accordingly. I mean. Well, I think, let, let me also say that this is sort of a step by, I, th these are difficult questions because there's so many different, I think what we need to do is come to a conclusion on what that distance should be and then let us kind of come back with additional information on that Perhaps that's the way to do it, and, and, um, and perhaps that will help you with the discussion. Just an observation. Requiring a 10-foot level emergency access, if it's strictly for emergency access, it would be my observation that you could get by with probably six, seven, eight feet. If it's to get a fire hose back there, if it's to get paramedics or something, the way it reads, it's a 10-foot emergency access. I have no problem with 10 feet. Now, if it's building codes, and if you're worried about slopes, and if you're worried about pop-outs of the hillside, that's another issue. But if it's, if what we're talking about is emergency access, I personally think 10 feet is plenty. It's still behind your house, whether it's emergency or not. You still only have 10 foot. And I don't know that anybody would want just 10 foot behind their house. That, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to think what sort of yeah. emergency you would have that uh, 10 feet would not be enough. Right. So the, the wording is, is the issue there as far as, you know, but I'm, I'm also concerned in addition to emergency access, uh, the setback from the slope. Okay, so let, let, let me, let me, what it states. Right. Let me, let me try to uh, maybe come to a consensus here. It sounds like that everybody's interested in looking at 10 or 15 which one that is, maybe that's still a discussion, but maybe we save that for another night. If you're all still thinking that maybe we just say 10 to 15, let us do a little bit more research and bring something back. 
Right, and, and then also, as uh, Commissioner Blackburn stated, we should look at the, the wording to make sure we're clear on what we're mm -hmm. discussing. And yeah, I, I, I guess what my thought there is that we, we have to be <clears> kind of <throat> careful when we put something in the zoning code. It may be, it may be nominally for an emergency reason or a public safety reason, but our code isn't a public safety code. It, it's really there for, for um, you know, light and air and other reasons, uh, comfort of living and that kind of thing. That, that's the reason for the zoning code standard. So we'll say 10 or 15 if everybody's good. 10 to 15, and then we'll, we'll bring some more information back and perhaps. Yeah, because if you say 10-foot level emergency, that's all they have to put up is 10-foot. Yeah, we, I think I'll remove the emergency discussion, and yeah. we'll just say we'll just okay. focus in on more. All right, of come back at us with that. That sounds good. Okay. okay, so that's number one. Number two. Number two. Our suggestion there is no change. Well, based on the, uh, the fact that the paths are approved and uh, th these parcels wouldn't be affected, I think uh, option one uh, sounds good to me. I, I have no problem with option one. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, number three, building height. Our suggestion there is also option one, which is no change because... West Covina has a fairly low building height now at 25 feet. I have no problem with option three. Yeah. Okay. Number four, standards for uh, deck review. And there, what we're suggesting is option three, which is um, side yard setbacks requiring 50% greater than the underlying zoning and also requiring a 25 to, to, to conform to the 25 foot rear yard for decks that require an and, AUP. And that's side yard and rear yard. That is correct. Okay. Any changes in the uh, require a variance, uh, Jeff? Well, what would happen is that would be for items that require an AUP. Okay. So anything under four foot would still be able to go to the normal setback. But if it requires an AUP between four and eight, then it would be required to meet that standard. If it's a variance, then it's really totally up to the Planning Commission what they want to allow in that situation. So we agree with option yeah, three. Yeah, option three sounds good to me. Okay. Commissioner Murphy. Commissioner Blackburn. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, number five then. Um, this is the common area maintenance and drainage for landscape. And we are suggesting option one, which is no change because track maps are final and so little we can do um, through a code effort. Well, I agree with that because it's already been approved by the city. So. I have no problem with uh, item number five, no change. Yeah. So Jeff, are we saying there, there's no other potential out there for, if we wanted to have CCNRs, there's nothing, there's nothing that already hasn't been undertaken that. On that do. property, because they have, the subdivision has occurred, there's no, uh, there's no method for us to require CCNRs. On that property? On, on what that about property. others? On others, we, uh, that we, we, we routinely do it on others. So, oh, you do? Yeah, the, the two uh, uh, projects that, you, that you have seen before you in the last, you know, uh, what the Planning Commission has seen before them over the last year, okay. which is Belinda, it had a CCNRs and an HOA, and the pro property on San, San Bernardino Road also had CCNRs with an HOA. Um, we have a couple other projects coming down, they're all going to have that same okay. situation. So it's a norm now. We, okay. we look at that as a norm. Right? All right. Thank you. Okay, so we have no problem with... All right, so I now we fine. get down to number six, which is uh, standards for covered parking. Our suggestion is option four, which is the combination if it's 4,500 square feet or has five or more bedrooms, whichever comes first, that would require an additional uh, third covered parking space. I have no problem with that. Because uh, Mr. Shrek said something about the you know long, uh, narrow spaces and all that, but a lot of the homes up in South Hills, the way they're built, will have a three-car garage or maybe a one-car garage set outside or a two and two so they it's not like you've got you know three or four in a row so there are ways that you can do the the uh, architecture to split up the garages so I sure don't have a problem with it but I think there's too many cars on the street the way it is right now and when you've got a five-bedroom house you're talking about probably five cars being out there so I have no problem with with uh, option four in number six I guess I do want to um, make make clear that um, 
while this does affect the South Hills lots, this is going to affect lots of construction that goes right. on in other parts of West Virginia, right. too. Right. Um, when, um, now, 4,500 square feet, in most deal. neighborhoods, you don't get to that level. Right. But right. I can tell you that you do get to five bedrooms. We see a number of houses that put in five bedrooms in 2,500 square feet or 3,000 right. square feet. So there's going to be some that hit that threshold. We've seen as many as eight bedrooms, I think, in well, houses. It seems to me the bedrooms today in the newer homes mm -hmm are a lot smaller than they were years ago. So they can crowd a lot more bedrooms. Yeah, smaller. well, it seems like it's both ways. Sometimes they're a lot bigger and sometimes they're a lot smaller. Yeah. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. So um, I'm sorry. So I guess I interrupted that flow of conversation. I think no, I, I just said final. my vote is to leave option four for number six, the way you have it. I would agree. Yeah, it's, it sounds good to me, definitely. The uh, only question I have on this, I guess, is um, let's see in this chart we had over here, when it gets to like 8,000 square feet plus, and does, does that come up? Uh, page three. Yeah, I know what you're saying. So th there's another city that has it at a higher, at higher threshold that require two additional parking mm -hmm. spaces, right? Um, I'm trying to recall if we've had one that big. I, I don't recall. Having one that sure, big. it's rare. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with option four. I just want to make sure when a, a house is enormous of that nature, if there's enough uh, I, parking spaces so we don't crowd the streets. Uh, I, I think, think another question that may be worth considering is a tandem issue as well, if, if tandem would be accept, acceptable in those such situations. So I, I can bring that information back. Okay, good. Yeah, I think it, it all looks good. I just want to make sure. Yeah, the curb appeal is important. Obviously, we don't want to make it look awkward. And when it gets really huge, we just, I think we need to make sure there, there's enough parking so we don't crowd the streets. Okay. Well, on the issue the gentleman brought up uh, of large homes having huge garages sitting in front of the house, the detraction of curb appeal is, is an issue, too. My preference has always been to put them around back somewhere, but I know that that can be awkward with some pieces of property. Yes. So, I don't know what we do about that, but. Uh, well, I think maybe right now, I think maybe it's just worth some consideration on maybe alternatives to, uh, to a standard three car garage arrangement. Um, maybe, maybe that's where we go. You need to note, uh, Don brought up the issue of the one car garages. Any discussion, any discussion on that? You want me to do any research on, on that particular, th the threshold for when we need to up to uh, upgrade a non conforming garage? Yeah. I'd like them to have more information about what the, what the thresholds are in, in that. I don't know about the rest of you. Yeah, it sounds good to me. Yeah, I, I'm not too sure. I, I, I agree with what you're saying that there's a threshold, but maybe those thresholds have to be looked at again. And I don't know what they are. Yes, I, we haven't provided you that information. We can certainly do that. We can provide you with the thresholds for you. Agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think that gives me um, some good direction. I think we've uh, whittled down a little bit. I think we're down to three issues to study. With the other three, we're going to probably say that, that they're fine. Um, I will do the research and we'll bring it back at a future date when I've had a chance to do the research and be able to present it to you in a manner that hopefully will um, okay. provide you with good, good enough information to Thank go you. forward. Okay. Takes us to continuation of oral communications. Anybody want to speak? And... No? You don't <laughs> want to tell us about the library? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> okay. Commission reports, comments, and miscellaneous items. Commission have anything to say? Any of the commissioners want to bring anything up? Just uh, quickly, uh, had an opportunity to attend some of the uh, grand openings uh, in McIntyre Center, and uh, they had their lunch wagon. I better be careful how I say it. <laughs> uh, Thursday night and the movies, and it was uh, very enjoyable. The parking lot out here was completely full and mm -hmm. very enjoyable. Thank you. So did you go? You went. The two were open in, in McIntyre. The, uh, the Guppy House. Guppy House and the other one, Hot Pot Stickers or something. Yes, I went to both of them. Did you? Mm -hmm. And give us a report. 
<laughs> I agree. I ate at Guppy House. It was great. You should check it out. I, I wish them success. The restaurants just haven't been able to make a go of it there for whatever reason. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Okay. Planning director's report. We have a project status report for August, uh, and we also have subcommittee minutes for a couple meetings, one in July, one in August. Okay. City Council action. Nothing to report on City Council action. That's it. That's, That's it. Good. All right. We're open for adjournment. I'd like to uh, adjourn again once in, in honor of uh, Officer Ken Reedy from the West Community Police Department. It was, it'll be 30 years this Saturday that he was uh, killed in the line of duty. And uh, I was on duty when it happened, and I will tell you, it'll never leave my memory. Uh, and the other person is Nancy Manners, who was a longtime council person and a mayor, and she's one of the first in the Southern California to, to achieve that, and she was always involved in uh, having her hand in something, whether she was on the council or not. And she was 93 years old, and she died Sunday. So I'd like to adjourn in both their memories. Okay. We have a motion for adjournment. Motion. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. <laughs>